Okay, good evening, everyone. This is a special meeting of the Eastline Board of Finance on Wednesday, May 7th, 2020. The time is now 6.38 p.m. Um, Camille? Yes. It's, th it's Thursday. Oh, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at an old agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. It's Thursday, May 7th, 2020, and the time is 6.39 p.m. I would like to get just a little housekeeping out of the way first, and that's why um, our recording secretary, Karen Symetric, sent out the minutes from our last meeting. Has everybody had an opportunity to review them? Okay. Are there any questions or concerns on those meetings, Me meeting minutes? If there's no questions or concerns on those minutes of April 29th, 2020, I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I'll, I'll make a motion. motion. Okay, thank you, Ann Chiquello. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Ann Santoro, thank you for seconding. <clears throat> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Very good. Motion carries 600. With that, we have one agenda item this evening under new business, and that is to listen to a budget presentation from uh, the Board of Education members, as well as the school superintendent. I think at this point, I'd like for them to get through the entire presentation and reserve our questions until the end. So with that, Jeff Newton, who is going to begin with the presentation? Do you need me to share a document or um, are you able to share a presentation with us? I yeah, will. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll, I will start, uh, I'll start off in, with a few brief comments and then uh, turn it over to Jeff. And he, he'll then have a uh, little uh, presentation with slides and so forth, but I don't have any slides. I thought I thought you'd like to look at me. So um, <laughs> the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to thank the Board of Finance um, for um, all the dialogue, comments, questions that you guys, you folks have, have done starting way back in November uh, with us developing a budget and the, the um, having you uh, sit in on our meetings um, with all of what's happened uh, and, and, and having several of you um, listening to our debates and deliberations, I think has been really good. I just, I just, I, I really commend the effort that you're putting in. Uh, I'd also like to thank the administra our administrative team, um, our teachers, our staff, the children, the families of East Lyme for everything, for do doing, making, making education possible under these amazing, uh, incredibly challenging times. And I think that that's, uh, that's uh, really uh, says, says well for our community and all the communities across the United States. I'm, I'm sure that everybody's just pulling, doing everything they can. And finally, I'd like to thank the Board of uh, Ed members. Um, many of them are on uh, listening in um, tonight uh, and like to thank them for making the time and their schedules uh, to uh, do, do what we had to do, which is go, go through some major adjustments to our budget proposal. And uh, in particular, uh, Eric uh, Ballman leading the, our finance uh, uh, committee as well has done a great job in, uh, in trying to, in trying to uh, figure out uh, how to make everything uh, add up correctly. So, so with that, um, so with that, I just, I just got to say a couple of words here and that is, I just, you know, back, if I think back at like at Christmas time around Christ, the Christmas break and so forth, who would have thought we'd be here today uh, with what's happened? Uh, and it was amazing. In March, it was, uh, we were just coming back from Costa Rica, my, my wife and I, uh, we barely got back into the country uh, and everything was absolutely turned right, just completely upside down. There's just no doubt about that. It was an amazing discontinuity that occurred. Uh, and I'm so impressed with how everybody has just, just picked up the pieces and worked so hard 
to create a new school environment for our children. Um, the, the families have stepped forward so 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 well. All the teachers and everything. It's just it's it's just in, incredible. Well, now we know that that school is not going to reconvene for the for the remainder of this school year. The governor has come out and, and said that. And I just caught it caused me a, a few seconds to st stop uh, and reflect a little bit on it because I, I've seen, uh, seen, seen, thought about things and everything. And my heart just feels aches for those families that have uh, seniors that will be graduating um, this summer. Uh, we know that uh, we're going to try our very best to have some sort of a graduation. Uh, the board uh, next Monday is going to be hearing some of the thoughts around that. Um, but it's just, it's just, you know, not to have the graduation like we have in the past is very painful. Uh, I can't b imagine the stress that the juniors are going through, not having taken their SAT tests, uh, or some, many of them not having taken the SATs yet, and the uncertainty of what's, what's before, especially with this lag in, in the change in the educational situation. Our eighth graders, uh, there won't be, you know, a picnic and a, and a little ceremony uh, at the middle school. That's kind of that's kind of sad, and I would imagine. Uh, fortunately, they did get their 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 evening uh, visit uh, to the high school, but there's got to be anxiety because uh, again, uh, they're going to be moving into the high school just like with the fourth graders. The fourth graders are going to be moving up to the middle school next year, and um, I'm sure that that's going to be a fairly anxious uh, moment. But I, I must say, the one thing that I really really hurts is to think about first graders. First graders are in that incredibly important stage where they're, they're really grasping reading. And some of them, I'm sure, are doing just fine. And there were probably those ones that were just doing pretty, pretty good, but this discontinuity occurred. And it's got to have an effect on some of the kids. Uh, just, you know, it's just, it's, it's very painful. So I just think, I just, you know, think a little bit about that um, and everything. And then I think about all the folks across our community that have all of the, the issues as well. So we have to do what's the very best for our community of East Lyme, but we also have to do what's very best for our children. And I think the budget uh, um, adjustments that we've uh, developed uh, and that our superintendent and his team will walk you through, um, um, I think the board unanimously uh, uh, approved them, um, and I think it's the right path, the right thing to do, given where we're at um, with the whole situation. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, turn, turn, turn the uh, microphone over to Jeff, and he's going to, uh, with Amy, he's going to uh, take us through some uh, slides detailing um, the, uh, what we've done with our uh, budget recommendation. Um, so Jeff, uh, take over. Thank you, Tim. Uh, appreciate it. Um, you know, and uh, I just, I also want to echo, uh, you know, the thanks uh, to all the groups, you know, and parties that, that Tim had mentioned. Um, it, it's been a whirlwind uh, the last, uh, you know, two, three months and, and, and weeks and, uh, you know, people have really stepped up. It's amazing. Uh, and, you know, it's also, it, it is sad. And I was at central office. Uh, I'm still actually here now. And I went over to Flanders earlier and, uh, you know, just went out to see the Miracle League field and just walking through the halls of the school it's like it brings back memories of, you know, where's the kids? So it was, uh, uh, it just kind of had a moment there, but we miss them and we hope to have them back, um, you know, in September. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, so uh, let me first ask, uh, has everyone, Camille, the, the document that we sent, everybody has received a copy of that, um, the uh, revised adopted budget booklet. I think everybody's got that. Just want to make sure. Let me, uh, let me see if I can bring it up. So everybody sees it. Well, we're, yeah, we're, we're not, I'm not going to go through that now. I just wanted to make sure what we're going to talk about it af afterwards, uh, obviously, but I just wanted to make sure everybody had that and I'll go through, I'll pull up the PowerPoint and, um, you know, I can share, I'll share that to start, but I uh, just want to make sure everybody had a chance to put eyes on that. We, we'd sent that, uh, but so, let's start first yeah, with, let me share everybody... my screen. Everybody got that? So, okay. Uh, let me just double check. So everybody received the updated, um, or I should say the revised East Lyme Board of Education budget document dated April 30th. 
Yes. Yes. Great. 30th. Yes. You're talking about the adopted budget, correct? So there was the original packet that came out in the booklet. Yep. That was the original adopted budget on February 24th. Mm -hmm. And then Jeff had sent out an email, which I forwarded to everyone, with the revised copy of the budget dated April 30th. Yes. Okay. Great. Just want to make sure everybody's got the right materials. Perfect. Uh, as we're all <laughs> navigating through Zoom here. So, all right. With that being said, let me share my screen and I'll pull up the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, presentation. And then we're going to go through some slides uh, and talk through some of that. So, um, hold one sec. And uh, see if I can get, uh, there we go. Slide four. All right. Everybody see that okay? Yeah. Okay, can everybody hear me okay as well? Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Yeah. Super. All right. So, um, you know, again, as, as Tim said, thank you all, you know, very much. A lot of hard work has gone into uh, this revised uh, budget and a lot of time and effort, you know, by our administrators, you know, our Board of Education. Uh, you know, a special thanks, you know, to, to my team um, and the work that, you know, Mariana, Amy, uh, Kim, um, and Chris Lund, uh, you know, our facilities director, you know, has done, especially, you know, Mariana, a lot of time in quickly turning over and changing, you know, the numbers. That's, that's a tall order and a lot of effort went into that recently. So I just want to start by saying that. So let me also just kind of recap a little bit, you know, and Tim had mentioned, you know, the impact uh, of COVID-19. You know, it, it, our budget really has been, you know, changed uh, uh, drastically in, in our, our lives. Uh, in, uh, in the education world. You know, I mean, administrators and teachers, their jobs have been flipped upside down. Um, and that has been, you know, immensely challenging. Uh, but through it all, you know, they are maintaining, you know, the education, you know, and the engagement um, for our students. Um, and even more importantly, you know, they're supporting the social and the emotional aspects, you know, for, uh, for students and, uh, and families. And, and that's been huge because, you know, families, many families have struggled with this change. And uh, are, are now, I think, you know, getting used to the new norm, um, but you know, they're trying to work from home uh, with their own, you know, children and, uh, you know, and do their own jobs. Uh, it's been a challenge. And we've heard a lot of different feedback uh, on that. And we've tried to gauge our work and moving forward with that. We've also been working through, you know, a lot of guidance, communication, um, and regional discussions, you know, with the State Department of Education, uh, the governor, and, uh, you know, area superintendents. Um, and following, you know, their lead, uh, the information coming from the governor and the commissioner um, on, you know, next steps, you know, in all of this. Uh, I'm on a regional board with uh, other area superintendents. I'm one of the co-chairs uh, of the entire group. And, uh, you know, we meet weekly. I just had a meeting this afternoon and, you know, lots of different topics, graduation, uh, you know, grading was a big one that we just had, had finished up. So we are talking regularly and we're trying to come across regionally in doing many of the same things. Uh, and that can be challenging, um, but it's, it's important um, as well. And I just want to mention, you know, the, the Board of Education and, and our finance subcommittee, um, a lot of time that they've given since March, you know, the Board of Education has met six times, mainly talking about the budget and, and making revisions. Um, they've done a lot of work uh, on this. And the, the finance subcommittee of the board, you know, they've met five times, you know, to review and, and, and make modifications you know, to the budget. Um, it's a lot of time on Zoom, but, uh, you know, and many of them have jobs as well. So kudos into the work that they've uh, engaged in. You know, we, um, we understand, you know, the reality that uh, has come forth with, uh, you know, COVID-19. You know, it's brought change. It's brought uncertainty, um, you know, for, uh, for our country, for our state, for our town. Uh, you know, we all know what we're dealing with unemployment, uh, with unemployment, with recession, um, the stresses and fears that go along with that. Uh, and the changes, you know, in our lives, uh, our practices, you know, and our relationships. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it, it was nice to hear, you know, with the unemployment in East Lyme, it's, it's a little better than, I guess, what the state average is right now, but there's still, you know, a number of, of, of families and folks that are dealing with unemployment across East Lyme. That all brings uncertainty um, in what the future holds. And, uh, you know, when will there be, you know, viable treatments? Um, if a vaccine will ever become available, uh, hopefully sooner than later, and uh, you know how effective will it be? Uh, when will the employment and the economy rebound? Uh, we hope um, sooner than later, 
Um, and, you know, when uh, will social distancing, you know, not be necessary? Or, you know, will we be trying to start a school year next year with students and teachers, you know, social distancing? So there's a lot of talk about, you know, how that might look next year. Uh, thoughts of, you know, maybe five to seven kids in a classroom all spread out wearing masks. We don't know. That could be a reality. And how we handle that and deal with that is going to be, um, you know, something that we're really going to have to take some time and regionally think about, you know, and work through. So um, you know, it leaves us as a district, um, you know, and as a town with, with a lot of questions, uh, you know, and concerns. Um, yeah, kids are going to be out of school now, and you know, we know for sure, you know, for six months from when they went out, you know, in March, March 13th, um, through now what hopefully will be September when hopefully they can return. That's the longest period of time that we've seen, that I've seen in my lifetime for, for students to be, you know, away from the structure of a school building. Um, some are going to be fine when they walk back in the doors, many are not, uh, and it's going to take uh, a while to um, build that restructure, you know, for kids who may not necessarily have the structure at home that they're used to, you know, during the school day. So uh, that's going to take some work. Will there be rebounds of COVID? Um, there very well could be. The fall, maybe the winter, um, we, we don't know, um, but there's, there's concerns with that, and, you know, we have to be prepared to address that. Uh, also concerned about, you know, the safety and the morale of our teachers and staff. Um, you know, there are many teachers that are fearful of coming back in the building. Some that, you know, have immune deficiency disorders um, and uh, potential illness. So we've got to be careful there. Uh, concerns, obviously, about children and, and gaps in learning. Um, and obviously, you know, the stresses uh, on families. So it brings us to the question of how should we prepare you know, for the 2021 um, school year and you know, the things that we should, be, we should be doing. So it brings us to a problem statement. Uh, and, you know, and that statement being that, you know, again, you know, this September, you know, children will have been out of school you know, for six months. Um, highly likely uh, that school as we knew it, is, it's gonna look different. Um, it has to look different. Um, and, uh, you know, until we get, you know, a vaccine in place and this goes away permanently, um, things are going to be different. And this is an enormous change. And obviously it's, it's unprecedented, you know, for our, uh, for our kids. Um, you know, we're already beginning though, um, through all this to adapt, you know, to, uh, new, uh, a new norm and, uh, you know, these uncertainties, the efforts have been amazing. Um, between staff and children and families and parents. It's been, uh, it really has been incredible. Um, we've moved, you know, to remote learning, one-to-one -to -one device usage. Um, and, uh, you know, technology uh, has just been um, what it's become and, and what it needs to be moving uh, into, into the future. Uh, you know, we've, we've given out, we said this a couple of times, we've given out over 350 uh, devices, laptops to families. We've equipped over 30 families with internet. Um, that was our first charge to make sure that, you know, families uh, could get on um, and be able to, um, you know, begin working, you know, on, in their homes in an online uh, environment. So, uh, you know, this is, it's been big and uh, people have, have done a nice job uh, with this change. So budget factors to take into account, um, you know, by the, that have been taken into account by the Board of Education, you know, we, we have to find a happy medium, you know, between um, supporting our schools and our kids, you know, and, and bringing forth a minimal tax increase. And, you know, we, we understand that. And right from the start, uh, you know, we, we appreciated, you know, your participation, you know, Board of Finance members and, and many of our meetings over the last, you know, uh, two and a half months. Um, the Board of Ed has been, you know, very receptive and very understanding that, you know, we have to be able um, to, uh, you know, to, to find a happy medium in this. So, Again, you know, to kind of recap, COVID-19, it's, it's brought forth, you know, the recession, unemployment, um, potential, um, you know, concerns with tax increases and concerns, you know, regarding decreased revenue. So it would not be appropriate, uh, we all know, to push forward uh, that February 24th adopted budget that came forth from the Board of Ed. Um, we know that that is just not appropriate in the fiscal landscape that we currently have. But it's also not appropriate for us to have the district unprepared for the challenges that lie ahead uh, in, in the coming year. So we, we have to be very cognizant of, uh, of that. So there's, when we ask ourselves and we've asked ourselves through this whole process, you know, what is, you know, most essential, you know, in moving forward, um, three things, you know, really, uh, really come into play. Uh, and, and first and foremost, you know, we don't want our kids coming back uh, to, you know, less support, 
um, than uh, when they left us after being out for you know a six month period of time. We need staff there to help support students you know who've been away from school, um, and we've got to keep uh, staff morale. Um, high, uh, during a critical uh, time period where, again, their lives, our teachers' lives have changed dramatically and they're trying to, to now teach remote, remotely and could potentially continue, you know, into, into next year. And, and that brings us to the second component of, you know, technology for students and staff. It's a critical and essential element, you know, for next year. As I mentioned, you know, we've given out over 350 devices. We pulled, you know, all those devices out of classrooms and carts, um, you know, out of the schools. Um, we're not going to see all 350 come back, uh, you know, and, and those that do, you know, might have damages, who, who knows, but we're not going to see all of them back. But we got to make sure that children, you know, have equal access uh, and support across the board and our teaching staff, you know, has equal access and support to engage kids next year uh, in, in education, whether it be in the school um, or, you know, out of school for a lengthy period of time again. And then the last piece is, you know, the special education component. This is, has been one of the most challenging um, feats uh, with, uh, with what's going on through all this because, you know, you have a number of students um, with individualized education plans. You know, we have, you know, close to 440 students, you know, who have IEPs. Um, many of them are very significant and detailed documents that require a lot of support and many hours of support during the course of a week that's one-to-one. -one. We can't meet that uh, right now. Um, our teachers are doing the best they can with as many hours in the course of a day that they have, but um, our kids, students are, are not getting, you know, exactly what they need. So that could be impactful next year with having to provide increased services. Could be impactful this summer with providing more, more services and, and there could be costs associated with that. Um, we don't know the answer to those questions yet, but uh, we just have to be prepared for that realization that we may need uh, additional dollars down the road to help support, uh, help support our students in, uh, in moving forward. So to kind of recap and show you, you know, where, where we were, you know, back on February 24th, you know, we, the Board of Ed unanimously had adopted uh, a budget of 51,699,974. A lot of work has, and a lot has changed since then, things that never thought were imaginable, um, but here we are. And uh, this uh, April 30th, uh, the Board of Education revised budget, bringing it down to 50,873071, with the total reduction uh, of $826,903. Um, and again, you know, six Board of Ed meetings, five uh, FFO um, committee meetings, um, they, they they uh, really did a lot of work and we all kind of dug into the weeds and, um, and, and found some dollars that uh, did, uh, we needed to cut. So that we broke down, you know, what those reductions uh, um, So uh, this slide is really the, the staffing that was uh, reduced um, out of next year's budget. Many of these were new positions um, that you, I'm sure you're aware of, you've seen, you know, these previously. Um, but uh, you know, we were hopeful to get these into next year's budget to help move us forward. We have eliminated um, all of these. Um, I'll just reference you know, custodian at the high school and custodian at Niantic Center. Um, we had plans to put a 0.5 custodian at Niantic Center because you know, there was a need next year. We were delaying that hiring. Um, due to COVID, they've done a lot of work, our custodial staff. Um, and they'll have more time this summer. So uh, we feel like we can delay that to save money. And then also a custodian uh, left the high school and took a vacant position at Flanders Elementary School here. So we're holding off on that hire. Um, and, you know, let, you know, everybody will kind of work hard. And again, a lot of work has been done um, recently uh, while kids have not been there in this summer too. The time to, so we feel we can hold off on that hire. So I just wanted to reference that. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you can see we've reduced security hours uh, that were proposed for next year, uh, paraprofessionals as well. We've, we've cut out some paraprofessionals um, uh, as well. So that's the staffing side of things. And then additional reductions, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we got into the we dove in, we took, um, you know, advice, uh, thank you for some of your feedback, Board of Finance members through questions, as well as our Board, as well as our board of Ed members, and, and dug in and options, you know, in all of these areas as well um, in our professional development areas, substitute services, textbooks, um, postage, staff travel, you know, instructional supplies. Um, you know, you can see the gamut right down to, you know, reducing, you know, some library books as well for, uh, you know, for next year. 
Um, so those two totals, you know, add up to, um, you know, that uh, um, 800 plus thousand dollars. And then just to, we did add dollars, you know, back in uh, when all said and done for the technology acquisition plan. And we'll explain that in the whole acquisition plan in just a few minutes through some budget slides. But we added 75,000 back in. So I wanted to make sure you know, that was clear you know, to everybody as part of the overall acquisition um, payment that would be in the operating budget that we'd be paying back over five years. So we'll, we'll share that out in just a minute. Um, so other important points you know, with, with current year, um, non-expended funds, you know, we've got a lot of questions um, and I'm getting emails, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, and this is across the state, thinking that because schools are shut down for uh, you know a couple months, um, that there's tons of savings that are going to come forth. Um, not necessarily the case. There's going to be savings, but you know there's a number of contracts you know under the, the governor's executive order that we had to we, that we had to renegotiate, and we couldn't just buses, for instance, because buses aren't running. We can't just say we're not paying the bus contract for the rest of the year and saving all that money. Wasn't the case. We had to negotiate that. And you know what? We did a good job. The best in the region, actually. Um, we got, we're paying 65% of the rest of the remaining contract for the rest of the year. Other districts are paying upwards of 80 and some are paying the full amount. So we, we did well there and, and that, that netted us some savings. Um, there's also savings, obviously, in spring sports you know, in, in those stipends. So we feel that um, right now we're approaching about $400,000 in end of the year um, money and, and savings. Um, there's further work that needs to get done as we continue to, to close out, you know, POs through May. Um, so the Board of Education and FFO, um, they've got to do some further vetting of the dollars that that's warranted to see what that final amount is going to be. But um, we'll talk about this in just a minute with the technology slides, but we um, are hopeful to use, you know, 206,000 of that 400,000 um, of end of year funds to offset some text, uh, some uh, technology costs, you know, this, this summer. So uh, that leaves us with roughly, you know, another 200,000, which I, I think, you know, we, we need to talk about potentially, you know, giving that back to the town and helping to offset, you know, the costs. So uh, that's something we're looking at and, uh, you know, gaining in on, um, you know, what that final number is going to be. Last piece I want to mention, because this is important, the fact that, you know, the elementary projects, um, you know, they're done. Um, we're finishing up, you know, all of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the final components that needed to be fixed uh, here. It was a $37.5 million project. We are not borrowing the remaining 400000 of that uh, approved money. So um, that's saving you know, the town having to go out and, and borrow more money. Um, so we think that's an important factor you know, to make sure um, is, is out there for our community. You know, we came in under budget and uh, you know, we, we got uh, our schools uh, are in great shape and we appreciate again you know, the town supporting that and the Board of Finance supporting that. Um, and us also not using, you know, 400,000 of that, that money. So that helps. So um, kind of just to, you know, to, to recap uh, a little bit, you know, we, we remain um, concerned um, you know, with the components of, you know, our uh, safety and morale for our teachers and staff, um, student learning, you know, moving into next year, what's it going to look like? We're going to talk about a blended learning model in just a minute. Amy's going to go through the slides and, and, talk about that on our families. Um, and, and given that, you know, there, there is an ever pressing urgency now um, to ensure that, you know, moving into 2021, that equity and access, you know, for all students is present. Um, we, we've got to bring forth a blended learning model. You know, we could be in school with kids next year in the fall um, and, uh, on a Friday. And on Monday, guess what? We're out for another thing. We have to be able to flip that switch on Monday to be able to keep learning rolling. You know, we're not going to get away with just you know, trying to provide continuing education uh, opportunities. We have to have live learning um, and remote learning ready to go and be teaching our kids. Uh, and, and some of that is happening now, but it's been more of a gradual release, you know, in East Line. Um, and that it's been positive uh, from the majority of our, our families that we've gotten feedback on. So um, that's going to be important. Also, you know, increase our use of, of metrics, you know, to monitor improvements. That's something the Board of Ed and, and administration started talking about more at the beginning of the year, more use of data, you know, to track our progress. It came up in some of the recent conversations um, that we had. Um, you know, we've got uh, some Board of Ed members, um, Barry Sheckler being one of them, who, uh, you know, is a master at this and is going to help us in these areas. Um, and, you know, uh, we're going to work, you know, through administration and through one 
our uh, AAA subcommittees uh, of the Board of Ed to, to really start honing in on, you know, some of those metrics uh, and multiple data points uh, in measurement. And then, you know, we, we have to continue to move our district, you know, in the right direction. We have a five-year long-range plan, and we're in year three of that. We've got two more years. And ironically, you know, at the end of those five years in that long-range plan, it speaks to our students living in a digital society and living in you know, really a more digital world. Um, so uh, the plans for technology are going to help are going to help get us there, and hopefully, you know, they need to prepare us, you know, for for next year. So, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Amy Drown, our assistant superintendent, and she's going to walk us through some of the technology slides now. Um, so, Amy, I'll uh, I'll run the slides and just give me the cue, you know, when you're ready. Okay. That would be great. Thanks, Jeff. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. And I'm happy to be here to speak on behalf of our students and families and what it is that they need in the coming year, as well as on behalf of the Board of Education. Um, one of the things I just want to point out before I begin that has been consistent um, pre-COVID versus during COVID, if you will, is the Board's unwavering support of the investment in technology. We already had the developed sense of urgency pre-COVID, knowing that we needed to address some universal design for our students that really aligned to some career and college readiness and really thinking about how we're integrating technology in the classroom. Now, during COVID, I would say the urgency has accelerated at a speed of unknown um, 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 leverage, I guess you could say, and it has really um, caused us to really say, you know, without a doubt, this level of investment in technology is deeply a need and certainly something um, that we feel is the best instructional model for our students based on this new reality. So just to start out, I want to be clear that as we really look to support our students and families right now during this, we have been uh, using what's called a continued educational opportunity model for our students and families and really getting our students to continue to engage um, with opportunities that our teachers are releasing on a weekly basis and then supporting through an office hour structure. And one of the things we're aware of, is that was a um almost a crisis response right you know something happened um, in regards to notification we knew in regards to COVID implementation so therefore it quickly became okay you now need to move this educational system that you know into a virtual um, environment uh, basically within five days um, was our challenge and so in doing so we've really embraced this continued educational opportunity model however now we know this model our students know this reality, our parents know how they feel right now, our students know how they feel, and our teachers know how they feel. And in order for us to reflect on that, see where we are, see what it is that we can really do for students and families, one of the things we feel is that our instructional model in East Lyme is forever changed based upon this experience. And one of the things that we want to invest in, and we've always wanted to really invest in, um, but it's really just come to the forefront, is a blended learning model, where our students can really be online learning as well as gaining learning experiences face-to-face. To a situation like this occur again, we are actually using tools in the classroom that can immediately be transferred over to tools being used at home. There is not a learning curve as much as there's been for parents and students because they are already experiencing and using those tools in a face-to-face -face environment and then also in the home environment. So we want to be clear that really blended learning will become our new instructional model for 2020. Uh, one, and that's really because we need to develop the capacity for our students to be learning in both environments. Jeff, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So when we think about free and public education, we think about free and public education, it's the student's rights and it's our obligation. So the ways that we define district, our obligation is really, if we think of it, is sort of through four lenses. Um, if you look at uh, the first two, our obligation is number one is we have to always understand the reality of our students and families and really what they've been through. And that's what they've been through always right and not that's just not just during this time but really understand what the realities are of our students and families 
And the second piece of that is also to reduce the burden on families, right? So free and public education doesn't mean that mom and dad are necessarily funding the education. It means we are providing the tools for students to have access to a free and public education and the tools that they need in order to be able to engage in learning with us. Now, if you look at the third and fourth points, we also as a district, our obligation we need to plan and think about the future so we're future-proofing students. And we need to think about what does the start of the year look like in a classroom? What might it look like in winter or if they were out for short-term periods? And how can we make that a successful experience for our students as much as possible? And what tools do we need to put in their hands in order to do that? I think for us, when you look at providing both a classroom and online environment for our students, our hope is that we produce even greater student outcomes, which is where the metric conversation, I think, comes into play um, in regards to really hoping that by allowing our students both of those environments, we have increased growth and in student outcomes as well. But the bigger piece is when we look at sort of uh, the last two points is um, we also, as much as it's great to provide devices um, to families as well as to students, um, if we don't have the infrastructure back in the building for them to connect, um, that won't be a successful experience for our students. So we certainly need to make sure we have the building infrastructure in order to support additional mobile devices or I, then we have a poor experience for our students, which is not the outcome that we'd like. Our last point is really in the fact that if you think of us regionally and you think of us in a national competitive workforce, we really have to think about we need to promise our students that they're going to be career ready, whether it's post college, right out of high school, out of the military, whatever it may be. We, that's our obligation. We have to have them career ready. We have to have them in a competitive skill set regionally. And I think that's one of the ways that we develop the sense of urgency around technology is because um, we're aware that some of the towns around us have invested more than we have maybe over the years and have utilized it in a way that we weren't. So we knew that that was something that we wanted our students to be able to not only be regionally competitive, but also nationally competitive as far as workforce. So that's really how we see our obligation at this point and why the actions we're proposing moving forward align to that level of obligation. Jeff, if you could go to the next slide. I don't know if I just have a delay. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so, um, so then you may ask yourself, what would device allocation look like? So if I could have you start a blended uh, learning environment, right? So for us, what are those tools that we would put in students' hands? So as far as the instructional device allocation plan, the plan would be that our grade K and one students would receive iPad devices. I did actually include a photo so that you could actually get an understanding of the device itself. Um, but I also want to be clear, when we say iPad device, what's that dollar amount, amount that correlates to you, right? So it's $400 is the price that we are using for iPads. The price includes case. So as you can see on the iPad that I pictured there, I actually put a case that we often use for our students so you could see what it looked like. And then it also includes the cost of a training station for a classroom. Because one of the things we got to remember is that if we're equipping students uh, with their own device, we now might have a kindergarten class that has 19 or 20 students in it. They need somewhere to charge those devices during the course of the day. So typically um, it is best and better for our electrical bill. Um, if I have one charging station, which we're putting those 20 devices in, so then I'm taking up only one plug because obviously also our classrooms do not have 20 plugs uh, in order to charge those devices. So that $400 price um, includes the case as well as the charging station. The next would be for our grade two to 12 students, and that would really be mobile devices. I've also included a picture so that you can get an idea that when we say mobile devices and laptops, we, are, we put, wanna put hands of our students, um, they're called two-in-one devices, which basically the laptop can be a laptop, flip it, and it can be um, a screen. 
as well. So it, you're really getting two devices for the price of one. We have found that that's a, the best possibility for our students because it's allowing our students diversity as to how they use a laptop in the instructional model. And so rather than having to have an iPad and a laptop for grade two to 12, you have a laptop experience that combines both features, which creates a better experience for our children. Um, when we think laptops, we think $460 per device. I sort of, we have about 13 quotes right now in regards to laptop devices. And so we are picking the middle of the road as far as that $460 price per device. Again, that includes a case as well as that co cost of a charging station that I mentioned. I did put a note on the bottom though, because I want you to be aware that obviously, right, you know, channel that kindergartner who's taken that iPad and putting it right in the backpack along with their lunch and the ice pack and the, you know, the pencil case and everything and bringing it home. Um, we have to, we have to have insurance. Um, for these types of devices. As we're moving students and allowing them to go between these environments, insurance is certainly an additional cost. That is not included, you'll notice, in the per device cost that I have here. And part of that is because we're under discussion as part of FFO, talking about sort of maybe parents um, having to um, pay an annual fee and other options um, in order to think about that insurance cost and what that would mean and looking at statute as far as, you know, what's appropriate in that free and public realm to ask parents um, to, to pay and, and what does that look like? And Marianne and I have been collaborating and she's done a great job of, of really getting a regional um, we are lucky enough that we have, we do have districts who, uh, who did this way before us. And so we have their learned um, uh, groans and pains, if you will. And so, um, and we do have some districts that have been doing the insurance really well. So we are uh, reaching out to those and we'll be bringing that to FFO for a further discussion. Uh, Jeff, all set for the next slide. So then you may ask yourself, you know, so what are the priorities? So when we think about the priorities, so the priorities have always been the priorities from January on, right? So as we really think about the mobile infrastructure, as well as the devices, we have always thought of it sort of in this order. Um, we need to make an investment. There are urgency around these. We are aware that some of that urgency has obviously come to the forefront, but we have major priorities as a district in our investment in technology. One of the things we want you to see, and the reason why we want you to see this list, is that that use of technology is obviously an ongoing process. But at the same time, we really think next year, we're gonna be able to address a lot of these priorities. And that feels very respectful to our students as well as an obligation that we have to them. I did put an asterisk on the bottom because I wanted to be really clear um, uh, in regards to grades two to three. And if you note on the bottom, I made a comment in regards to being supplied with current laptops in the district. So I just wanted to be really clear in regards to the fact that our grade two to three students would be using the current laptops that we have in district because we currently have a fleet um, of laptops that are at least three to four years old. And because of the grade level and the way in which they use the laptops, we feel that that would be two grade levels. And also based on teacher input, as well as um, our instructional tech input, those would be two grade levels that would be utilizing the laptops that we already have in district um, for most likely the next two to three years. Because um, most computers can have a life term, at least for us, of anywhere from four to seven years, depending on how much transmission occurs between the two environments. So I did want to point that out. Uh, Jeff, if you could go to the next slide. So you may ask yourself, so those are a lot of priorities. How do you plan on supporting them? And what is the pro proposal in regards to how you're going to plan to sort of look at those and think about them moving forward? So if we really think about next year, and we look at our operating budget, we are really looking for uh, in our operating budget as part of the acquisition plan, $275,000, which would equate to us to over a $1.3 million investment. The outcome of that would be that 
all of our K to 12 students would have personal mobile devices to use as part of our blending learning instructional model. Our high school students, our middle school students, our grade four students, the iPads for K and one students would be a major focus for us and would achieve all of our students ha having access to those mobile devices. In addition, our teacher's devices are now on year four. We are slowly, actually just today, we received three more tickets on teacher devices because of use and because of what they're using them for now. Um, we, are, we always knew that within the next year, we were going to have to invest in better models for our teachers. And so we also have that as investment. You want to be able to give students a positive experience and teachers a positive experience with quality devices so that you're ensuring a positive experience for their teaching and learning capacity. So when we look at the allocation plan, that's the investment we see. It's all about the students and teachers and it's about getting those tools in their, those hands, reducing that burdens on families, as well as allowing the students to know that they have the tools during the day as well as at home as part of that blended learning model. And it is their device to utilize over time. So Jeff, if you go to the next slide. In addition, one of the things that um, we had always knew that needed to occur is obviously we want to always know that the management is there, right? So when you implement something of this capacity, I mean, we are, we are talking about possibly adding, you know, 2,500 devices to our fleet. That needs to be managed. And that needs to be really have some strong accountability so that the town parents and students know that their experience is improving and that we're having uh, better results for all really. So we have proposed in our budget an instructional technology manager and the purpose of this role is to really guarantee that the software and the devices that we're using are clearly monitored with fidelity and are leading to positive positive impacts on student achievement. And as Jeff mentioned before, this is one of those um, topics that I'm bringing to AAA to have a conversation around how should we monitor the blended learning framework? How should we monitor sort of software usage and making sure that we hold ourselves accountable to that as we move forward with our instructional model? The other piece for this, this manager is it's important for us that we monitored software usage. As you can see in our budget, we invest a lot in cross-district software as well as teaching and learning software. Part of that is because if it lives in more than one building, then it's considered a district-wide software. We need to ensure that we are getting the most out of those products and that those are producing the results we want for students. So this manager would be responsible for that. And in working with me under my within my curriculum department and as I oversee the 13 to 10 areas that we have within the district. The other piece for us is not only providing the metrics for feedback with the new devices, but also in collaboration with our instructional techs, there is a ton of professional learning that will be occurring uh, with our staff and actually is occurring, I think, day to day um, now within this new reality. And we need to provide that and ensure that that professional learning is resulting in student outcomes and is being tied to student outcomes and is making sure that this level of integration and this level of investment has produced a result for the town as well as produced a result for the students in the long term. Jeff? And then that leaves us to this year. Um, so when we think about this year uh, and the fiscal year 1920, we are hoping to be able to make an investment of $435,000. We have held tight to our CIP dollars. Uh, we have purposely done that really for two reasons. Um, one of them is because the elementary building project was wrapping up. Uh, we were unsure if there was going to be any sort of residual effects, you know, what was it going to look like when all the dust settled? Were we going to be in a, in a place, you know, technology wise? We used the CIP dollars for input. We had it held for infrastructure. So, you know, until that last tile is up and that last access point is hung as part of the elementary building project, we sort of made that decision to make 
make sure that we were sort of holding tight with those CIP dollars. The other piece is a lot of times we don't spend those CIP dollars as well until sort of towards the end of the year because so many um, vendors get people purchasing in July and we're more apt to get better pricing on some levels of work if we hold off a little bit longer into that late winter time period, we've noticed that we've been able to get some um, things done uh, at a lower cost uh, than maybe we would have. So that's the other piece. So we would like to use um, our CIP dollars, obviously, for this year. Um, we did have an incident um, in which we had a bulk of computers uh, due to uh, not one of our employees, but one of our outside vendors, um, a fire extinguisher exploding. Uh, where a bunch of computers were stored, being ruined. Um, and we did put in a tech uh, insurance claim and we did receive um, finances back to be able to replace those computers. And then our goal, as Jeff stated at the beginning, is to be able to use hopefully some end of the year funds, um, $206,000 in order to invest. Our goal is that if in the 20 to 21 fiscal budget we're investing in devices, we would like to use sort of this year's that CIP, that insurance settlement and that end of the year funds to invest in infrastructure, right? And we want everything working. We want it working in the classroom. We want the connectivity not to be a problem. So you'll notice in our outcomes, we're really looking to address the middle school and high school and their infrastructure to making sure that they thrive. At this point, if we did not do this project um, for the high, finish the high school infrastructure project that we started, as well as the middle school, they would not be able to operate with every student having a device. Um, it is the high school, it would be a wing and a half that would have only be able to support 20 devices per uh, classroom. And then our middle school at this point can really only support upwards of 75 devices per Kiva. And you may think that's a lot, but it's not when every middle schooler possibly walking in the door has a phone. <laughs> so right there, you might reach capacity of your 75 because their phones are connecting as they're walking in. So um, that's one of the things that um, for us, the infrastructure is really important in making sure we make that investment because we want, again, that successful experience for our kids. So this is how we're looking to use our funds, well, hoping um, at the end of this year in order to support that. I also want to note that thanks to the investment of the elementary building project, you'll notice I don't have the elementary schools on here um, because we were able to address all three elementary um, buildings as part of the project. And so their infrastructure is spot on and ready to go um, for successful device um, support and being able um, to support upwards of over a hundred devices actually in every single classroom. So that's great. Um, Jeff, next slide. So I'll just, I'll just state in closing, um, I just wanted to point out in regards to, as you look at the um, instructional model and as you just think about students and you think about our obligation, I think for us and on behalf of the Board of Education as well as administration and students and staff and even, you know, we had five more families today come and pick up five more laptops. You know, it's just getting more complex for families. The need is there. We feel as though this is the utmost respect in meeting the obligation of our students and we truly do feel that this investment will only produce better results for our students. So uh, Jeff, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, uh, Amy, appreciate it. Um, you know, and, and just to, to mention, you know, we, we've gotten questions, you know, from some parents as to, you know, why isn't, you know, East Lime, you know, uh, why don't we have, you know, technology devices in the hands of every kids and why aren't, why aren't we ready sort of thing, you know, and we've had plan, we've been working, you know, towards this um, for a period of time. And a couple of years back, you know, we were going back and forth and ready to try and say, okay, we need one-to-one -one devices. Let's start at the high school. Uh, then we did a deep dive into our infrastructure and quickly realized that, it's not ready. It's far from it. Hence, you know, some of the high school has been done over the last couple of years and that remaining money that you saw, you know, will finish the high school out uh, altogether. Um, so we were in process with trying to get there, but, um, you know, it, it was spread out, you know, over time and uh, the infrastructure came first. So 
So, you know, again, when you ask, you know, how should we prepare for the 20, you know, 21 uh, school year? Well, you know, it's, it's getting those devices, you know, into the hands of kids. Um, we've got great resources in the number of many districts across the state that have already done it and are already doing it. Um, so we can reach out to them and, uh, you know, and get feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's got to propel our students and uh, prepare our students and staff for, you know, for next year. Uh, as, uh, again, we've mentioned a couple of times, we could be in district, we could be out of district for a long period of time. So with that being said, um, that's the end of our, our slide presentation. So I'll, I'll stop sharing now and then, you know, we can open it up to, you know, to any questions and go back to a slide as necessary if, uh, if we need to. But thank you for your attention, uh, you know, with that. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Amy, for that uh, presentation. I mean, um, professional as always, it's very, uh, you know, clearly defined what the goals are. Um, I really appreciate the effort that the entire Board of Education and particularly the FFO team put in, in going back and doing it, diving to those numbers while and coming up with some reductions while still ensuring that we can roll forward with this technology plan. Um, having, having said that, there, I'm sure there are probably still questions from our board. So I'd like to start with the veterans of our team and maybe start with Ann Santoro to see if she has any questions for the, um, the board of end members tonight. Hi, I have a few. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll try to narrow them uh, because it would give the other board members a, a chance to ask their, theirs. And usually we, as you know, we typically cover each other's questions one way or another. Um, I was particularly interested in um, savings from this year. Uh, as you probably uh, have seen from my uh, my being on the board the last couple of years, I'm always interested in revenues and making sure we're clear on revenues because that's the source of paying for everything. So in my mind, um, you know, uh, looking not just forward to what we might have next year, but looking back, uh, and you mentioned, Jeff, that there would be savings and that you're working on that. Um, I just want to get a little bit more detail and I, A, and then B, when might you think you'd have that number? Because I personally would love to see a, a good um, a solid set of numbers um, before deliberations, if possible, because uh, that will, you know, help me to make some uh, clearer, clearer decisions. Um, I, I'm well aware of the governor's order 7R. There was also a very um, helpful uh, piece written by uh, a memo rather written uh, by the uh, by legal counsel for the Board of Education of the state and that also illuminated you know ways that you can save and ways that you can't um, so I'm aware of those so for example with school staff what are the possibilities with your uh, transportation what are the possibilities with special education, very limited, you know, we have to keep the plans in place, but ours perhaps could be reduced. So, um, but there were other categories um, not touched upon by executive orders and not touched upon by that legal memo, which I think was sent to all the superintendents. Um, but, you know, typical things that I would think might be things to look at. And I'll just run down quickly because I think you're gonna provide that information but rather than have me send you a memo or something else. Um, so for example, you know, speakers and resources for students, uh, which haven't actually happened, um, professional or technical services for contracts that haven't happened like athletic officials uh, contracts, um, repairs and maintenance, you may have covered some of that. I was particularly interested in insurance um, you know, liability, auto, property, you know, um, most insurance companies now are giving a little bit of a leeway, a little bit back to the customer for insurance. Uh, risk is just not there. The buildings aren't there and the people are not in them. The risk is reduced. Um, travel expenses, utilities like oil, gas, and electricity. Um, some supplies, you've touched on that. Um, so, you know, I think, and also 
on the one hand, those would be a potential areas of saving. And then I also was interested in, for programs that you do run, um, where's your loss been too? Uh, I wanted to make sure that that was balanced. So um, you may have expected to get money from this preschool program and that preschool program, but now, you know, uh, a quarter of the year, uh, even close to a third of the year, not happening. So there's been some reduced revenue source there that would affect perhaps your substitute teacher uh, per, uh, or substitute uh, employee uh, workers being hired next year, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and then, so, so that I, I just, I guess it would be great to have um, some good level of detail with the savings uh, and putting into this pot, for example, the, the, uh, the other monies that you mentioned that you haven't used this year, you know, from uh, last year's uh, capital improvement project uh, 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 allocation, et cetera. So that was one area and, and you can comment on it now or you, we can just wait till you, you, hand, you know, provide that information at some point. But that, I did need a level of detail. Yeah, we and we can comment on a few of them, um, and and uh, we can definitely you know develop a, a level of you know uh, of these items, um, and then kind of cross track and see if there's any others that you want to ask about. But l let me just first mention um, you know some of the associated costs that you know we're going to incur because there are some of those out there that we haven't talked about. You know, number one, the unemployment yeah. costs. Um, you know, all of our um, before and after school staff members, um, you know, the aquatics program, all those staff members, um, th those are all, um, they're all on unemployment right now. We're having, as a district, those are revenue programs, but the revenue programs aren't making any money. So the operating budget is going to have to, or any of your money is going to have to offset, you know, that, uh, those unemployment uh, costs. You know, the, the aquatics program, it's uh, the aquatics, um, you know, the pool itself, you know, it's shut down right now. We're not taking in any money. Um, there's still, you know, associated costs, you know, with that food services is another one. Right. We have, that's a, big of, one. that's a big one. We have some of our food yeah. services, uh, members are still working, you know, they're on the front lines, giving out food every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, but other members are not, they're on unemployment. So, um, there's, oh, that's a revenue based program. Uh, so, um, that, that's a tough one. And then, you know, our creative, um, play school, uh, which is like that, the preschool, it's not the integrated preschool, the creative play school, you know, we have uh, unemployment as well. So those in Mariana, I don't know if you want to share anything else on, you know, unemployment, but we have to pay a pretty hefty uh, amount, uh, you know, on those costs. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure if any, everyone, because not everyone is aware, but municipalities, boards of education are a, on a reimbursement basis. So it's not like your typical private sector employer where every quarter they pay a percent that is determined you know, every year by unemployment and it goes into a fund. And then when someone is laid, you know, laid off or furloughed, it, it's not impacting the employer. For, I mean, for, you know, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's the DOL will pay the unemployment, but then we get billed for whatever is paid out for unemployment. So that's why, you know, we are seeing, we're going to see a spike in unemployment because we don't pay that every quarter. We just pay it when it happens. So. Right, right. So, um, you, yeah, so oh, go ahead, Jeff. I just was going to mention, you know, with, with repairs and, and maintenance, you know, as well, you know, we had so many backlog projects that hadn't gotten to, you know, the custodians and the maintenance staff are, are freed up. So they're getting a lot of those done. So we're not going to see, you know, hardly any savings, you know, repairs and, and maintenance. Um, and, you know, utilities and, and gas uh, as well. You know, the buildings, I, I've gotten that question a couple of times. Oh, the buildings are shut down. Uh, you know, must be saving a ton of money on, you know, electricity. Well, th they're not shut down. I mean, the custodial staff, contractors are still coming in and out. These are the times right now to get some of those repairs done that need to get done. I mean, Amy's talking about, you know, the infrastructure component. You know, we could have people in through ceilings and, and hallways, uh, you know, uh, all summer long. Um, but every time somebody walks in a room, a custodian, you know, the lights go on automatically. They stay on for a period of time and then they shut off and custodians are in every room they're cleaning right now and getting a lot of those summer projects done so we're, we're not going to see a lot of savings there and Mariana we talked a little bit about that maybe a couple thousand dollars um, but that's probably about it yeah so, so the the I got the most recent month's bills and really the decrease in the electricity probably averaged a couple hundred dollars per building we are seeing a little bit more in in natural gas um, savings because I think just the 
the year was it was it was a mild um, winter. So I, I think we're seeing more of a savings because of that. I don't know that we're going to see a huge savings just because, as Jeff said, there's still people in the buildings. Right. And, okay. Yeah, but that would be helpful, I, I think, just to see that and to see that, you know. Um, definitely list it out um, and to and to try to uh, let's fix a number if we can because um, clearly that is a resource that can be used either we you know you begin to buy devices sooner with that money that's available or it go or it goes back to you know general fund but then it's used next year so just to, you know that would make that process easier once you are clear on what that is you know I think uh, because it definitely would support this uh, technology plan, which, uh, you know, definitely uh, needs to be addressed. Um, so uh, I was wondering, um, and I, I'll, I basically have three major questions. That was one, which we will be working on. And then two um, was perhaps in your, um, it's a revised uh, summary uh, object code budget. Um, which we all got as, you know, your update. So um, I guess what I'd like to see um, is maybe a little breakout of the object codes that are in here that um, are attributable to the technology plan and what those amounts would exactly be. So for example, I can guess, you know, that let's say object code 320, you know, uh, would address it or 415 for internet services. but um, it would be easier if I saw a little bit of a breakdown of the ones that are most applicable. Um, because some of your costs are obviously by the way of the capital improvement uh, plan. And then some of your costs are in your uh, basic budget document, correct, for your technology. So um, it would be good to have that little bit of a extra detail if we could. And, you know, you don't have to answer that now, but that's between now and when we begin to deliberate. Um, and then the other thing, um, and I, I think perhaps the other members of the board will have similar questions. So I really wanted, I wanted to kind of drill down a bit without getting too technical on, on the devices themselves. And I know, we, you know we've seen the difference between the iPads and laptops and so forth. That's great and thanks for the slide presentation. Um, I'd like the pictures this time, that was, <laughs> that was good. Um, but I was wondering, um, first, uh, with existing devices that, the, that you have, and I see that they're going to grades two and three, and that some are a couple of years old. But I just wanted to have a sense that um, existing resources were somehow not going to be, you know, for lack of a better word, wasted or not, or not dealt with in some way, and that we would be able to use them in some way. Um, and incorporate them into this plan. Uh, and perhaps that's the, the extent that you can if they are, uh, they are mobile devices, not desktops, and grades two and three get the ones that you, that you mentioned. But I also had just a general concern because um, from speaking to, to members of the public, families, uh, parents, uh, who have, you know, I've spoken with over the course of the last weeks, um, it seems like many of them um, like their own devices. So what do you do with, uh, you know, what would, might, might be a, a way of dealing with the families or families that, you know, let's say a high school student, perhaps on, on route to college, you know, that gets that new little MacBook or something or whatever it is, and prefers that and wants to use that. So is that in this calculus, you know, in terms of determining the number of devices that you would need? or to allow for, for that, uh, for choice, if you will. You know, um, uh, some families uh, may not wish to, um, to have the device provided by the school, but they will do their own thing uh, one, for whatever reasons. So that was a, a one question I had. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I can answer that if you'd like. Um, so sure. I think for us, that becomes, that choice becomes a management issue. And it becomes a capacity issue for us to be able to troubleshoot for students. Because I think one of the great things that we have the ability to accomplish is that we are going to have students 
on the same device. <laughs> So mm -hmm. from a management perspective, I only have three technicians that support all five buildings and, and in addition, all the offices. Mm -hmm. And by minimizing the devices that they have to troubleshoot, I'm promoting a quicker response time and ability to assist students. Okay. And so I think one of the things we've learned for some district, and there have been, there's been about two or three districts that are in my assistant superintendents group that didn't go one-to-one -one and completely said, no, everyone bring their own device. And now what they're investing in is additional tech support because what's happening is Johnny's coming in with that new MacBook and Johnny's in the middle of class and he didn't charge it. Well, we don't have Mac chargers. So now Johnny, now we got to go find you another laptop device in order for you to use. And now Johnny's on a device that now you're on a PC. Johnny's always been a Mac kid, you know, so that that impacts the instructional experience. Um, for us. So I think that's one of the things we don't have the tech team capacity to be able to address that. I think that's one of the things we're trying to minimize where mm -hmm. our current lab type device, laptop devices go to grades two and three. I'm talking mm -hmm. about a gamut of about 500 laptop devices that are about 10 different models deep. <laughs> so okay. already there, there are 10 different models I'll have to support just within, you know, that device allocation. Um, and so Amy, so what I think I hear you saying is that let's say, well, let's say you could, um, let's say the system requirements are known for, for the devices and, and someone has even refurbished or upgraded their device. Um, so it's, it can, it can, you know, handle whatever platforms that you're using and learning platforms, but you still have this management issue is what you're telling me. Yeah, we certainly, yes. And the other piece of it, you know, one of the things we talked about and envisioned is should all of our students have one-to-one -one devices, we envision a deployment of student help desk at the high school so that some of our tech savvy students will get some real world experience. We've talked about that even at the middle school for seventh and eighth grade. And that's going to be a better experience for our students when they're assisting their peers on the same device rather than, okay, I got 10 students coming up to me with 10 different devices and then we don't have the tools in order or and we don't have the budget to be honest with you you know my break fix budget is basically eighteen thousand dollars for an entire year so if i'm you know a kid comes in and he drops his laptop and cracks his screen i really can't touch that because that's his personal device and i don't want to be touching your personal device but now johnny shows up for four days with no device you know and so that's where management wise that creates a struggle for us for sure um from, so that actually brings me to a, a another i have many questions with devices but i'm i'm going to let others ask them as well because i think we're all going down the same uh, same path so to speak but i did have an, a question about insurance so you mentioned that you were able to speak to others in you know uh in a regional context you know other school systems and what they're doing they've had the they've had their devices uh they presumably have addressed the insurance question so what have you found out so far if i can ask are parents paying not paying is school paying mariana you want to touch that one sure so so um there's a combination some there's insurance companies out there that will um, provide insurance um, for the devices if they work directly with the parents and the device goes out to the insurance company for repair and then comes back. Most districts, though, have gone away from that and are doing it in-house because the, um, the time frame for getting the repair was too long. Mm -hmm. So they keep a loaner. They keep it like kind of a, a, a some loaner. Mm -hmm. And so the device will come in and uh, be repaired. There's a set criteria that is covered. You know, the parent pays a set fee every year. And, um, you know, so it depends on what we want to do and how much we want to charge, but, you know, it might cover one cracked screen, possibly two. Um, you know, it, it doesn't cover lost devices. Um, that would be obviously the responsibility of the parent, but there's a whole list of criteria we would need to come up with. But most um, districts have gone with in-house now just because it's easier and um, the student isn't, um, doesn't, you know, isn't without a device for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. 
this I have a sort of follow up for for Amy perhaps, but um, so that grades two and three where we're using the older devices, do you know what the total number of that might be for the for the for that? Uh, right, they're not going to get new devices; they'll get the used two to three year old devices. So, would you know how many devices that might be? We're, we're estimating about three hundred and fifty for for that. Okay, so that's kind of what you have up floating out there now that you have. Uh, given Correct. to the community. We, right. The community right now has the best laptops that we have in district in their homes right now. Okay. Yes. Okay. And All our right. stockpile of laptops only totals up to 500 as far as ones that are four years or newer. So I am at max capacity at 500. Otherwise, then I'm putting devices in kids' hands that are six years or older, laptop wise. Okay. And then my last question is just um, with respect to the learning model in a way, you know, um, so, so I guess um, not just having the devices, but um, it's kind of like giving a department, you know, equipment anywhere in town. Do you feel that getting the devices you're going to get, you know, will help with your learning model? Uh, and, you know, what about um, obsolescence, you know, how, how, how fast, would, would these perhaps become obsolete? Yeah, so I think one of the uh, conversations that we've been having at the board is there will, there will be a cycle that will be developed. So if you think about the, the seniors, you know, if they were to get devices, those devices will therefore, you know, be brought down to the elementary school after they graduate, you know? So you'll, we'll create a cycle so that we are not on a replacement cycle to all of them get renewed at the same time. You know, some students are gonna, I mean, our ideal would be if that fourth grade kiddo can get that device and carry it all the way to eighth grade. You know, th that would be our ideal because then they've had experience with the tool in fourth grade, you know, they, cause I think that's the other thing, Anne, to your point of them liking the personal devices, part of why they're liking the personal devices, I think is because we're not providing them a tool that they've been using all day long, possibly as part of their instructional model in the classroom and then also using at home. So now this is also teaching our kids that mindset of professional workplace personal workplace, right? So here's my personal device first. here's my professional device, which is that school-based device. So I think in an ideal world, we would like to see those fourth graders get their hands on them, have a year of learning it. That's a nice transition to go into fifth grade knowing I already have the tool. I already know how to log in and get access to what it is that I need and then keep that mm -hmm. and then keeping a cycle so that we ensure that we are not, you know, we are chunking grade level renewal over time. Um, and creating sort of a universal design for that renewal, yes. And then think about it too, if you think about the K-1s with the iPads, you know, when the first graders go to second grade and get that laptop, well then the first grade lap iPads come to the incoming kindergartners, I right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it creates that cycle for us. Okay, well, thanks so much. I'm, I'm condensing a number of questions and I kind of skipped <laughs> okay. a bit. You can ask me okay. more later. <laughs> but but um, there'll be um, there'll be many questions, and I'm sure there's, there's overlap. So thanks. Thank so you. I think while we're knee deep into the whole technology plan and delving into that and, and getting our questions answered, um, I was going to call on everyone individually and just have all of their questions um, posed. But I think let's just stick with technology for now and make sure that everybody's technology questions are answered before we circle around and maybe go to some other areas. So um, who else has questions for the board regarding this technology plan? Anybody? So we're all, I do. okay, we're all squared away. Okay, Ann Ciccello, you have a question on the technology okay, so, plan? Um, yeah, I do. Um, if you are giving the kids, you know, let me just see where I am. Organized. Um, you've given out laptops to the kids like 350 is that correct, correct. you said correct at that point okay so these laptops can they be you're going to use those for second and third grade are these the same ones that you're planning to purchase for gr grades um, what is it 2 through 12 or are you switching over to a different brand of laptop we are switching over to a different brand of laptop. Okay. Yep. 
because one of the things we were doing so, in March before this happened was we were actually having our students vote on the device that they liked because especially in secondary, it matters what they like, you know, mm -hmm. kids want larger screens and light. That's what we found out so far, right? So we've given, you know, we were putting up two to three models in main offices and asking students to vote and then asking teachers also for their feedback as well as in their classroom. So that's one of the things we found that this would be a better model for our students because one of the things we found is that our students like a larger screen and they like lighter weight. Okay. Um... Let me see what else I had here. Oh, um, when you're, you're going to start, let's say the kids end up having to, they go back to school and then they're going to have, you know, be at school. Will they also be having like assignments at that point? Like, let's say they're in school in September for a few months and you get the laptops. Would they be bringing them back and forth from like home to school when they're in school? Yeah, so that's the that's one of the things that uh, we need to look further as far as the insurance, because um, that's one of the things I think we're learning from the other districts is that you could have a separate bracket, depending on if those devices are just staying in the building versus if they're going back and forth from home. My idea would be, yes, we are having students travel with them because the, it's almost like a fire drill. We do one every month to adapt kids to that possible emergency. I feel like we should do that with students with the devices. Yes, have them adapt to doing that, that sort of back and forth, get them used to that experience. And then the other piece is, is we have an expectation of it wouldn't be continued educational opportunities next year should we be out for a period of time. It would be instruction continues from exactly where you left off and live instruction occurs almost like you're in school. Um, so we really wanna get our kids in the mindset of like, yeah, so you might not be back here on Monday, but at nine o'clock, you're still in reading group. <laughs> you know, and at 10 o'clock, you're okay. still going to be um, because we need to keep that going uh, for our students. And if they have the tool and we know that they have access to the software, then we can have that. Uh, we can have that accountability and that expectation. Yeah. So then they would they would necessarily be doing new work, not just reviewing old work if they were to end up being back at home oh, yeah. again. And the, in the learning they environment. Would keep, they would keep going with the curriculum. Yes. Okay. That's, the tip All right. Right. That's what we have to be prepared for next year, especially if it's, you know, an extended period of, of an outage. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, I've been, let's see. Is there any way, has anybody looked into leasing the computers instead of purchasing them? We have, um, we have looked into leasing. Um, and we've actually contacted a couple districts in regards to leasing. And one of the things I think we're noticing is that the terms are the terms in a lease. So say we are not in a fiscal place to be able to release, to you know replace a device in five years, but the lease is up in five years. So we got to move, we got to get into a new, uh, a new cycle. That's one of the things we've heard from districts and the majority of the districts, I think we've got, we're up to about 13 that we've talked to have leased. 10 out of 13 are going, are getting out of their leases um, because they're saying, you know, it ties you too tight fiscally. And then to be honest with you, I thought it was going to be a much bigger cost savings than it is. But really what people, what their encouragement has been is that get your tech staff well-trained to do all the troubleshooting on the devices you purpose, like get them to be trained on, you know, fixing a glass screen, keyboard replacement, knowing how to replace jacks within the computer. That's all the stuff that uh, districts who are leasing were saying, oh, you had to send it out. And then, you know, the device is gone for a week or two because in a lease, you can only use certain vendors in order to help fix it. So by, by using your own people, getting them trained, you're more apt to keep that repair model uh, on a quicker return. So, but we did look into it. Trust me, that was the first place I went actually uh, last October. <laughs> that was gonna be a great option. And I quickly learned, okay, I was way off of that. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, yep. 
Now, the next question, kind of going back, if the kids, if, if one of the laptops breaks, do you send it them out to the, the company and they repair it? Is that what you do? Or do you have to have somebody like in-house to repair it? Or like, yeah, would you so go that, to a, like so what, an outside but, vendor? So we con uh, so our three uh, techs that provide tech support across our district are a contracted service. Um, because it's a better deal for us. We could never afford okay. to pay the salary that we pay them. So we have a contracted service. So what would happen is that that contracted service okay. must provide X numbers of certification and job classifications for us based on the current models we have. So basically all they would do is they would almost send their three techs to almost like online school for our model. And then they would be the break fix. So, and they are right in district. So it would not be shipped out. It would be within district oh, pricing. So there'd be a faster turnaround time if, you know, these things break. Because, I mean, you know, in my office, we have, I think it's seven computers. And, you know, it seems like we're constantly calling them to say, hey, something, we're not on. We need to get on right away. You know, something's right. wrong. So, but there's somebody then in-house. So that, that's, that's important, especially with kids using any kind of uh, technology. Um, Correct. Any, any other oh the other question i had is um do you have anything just one quick more question um like do you have anything for like anti like viral like norton antiviral stuff or anything like that for the computers yeah so we use we use barracuda as far as a, a prevention software for us. And one of the things that, so that's really important to go back to Anne's question on the personal device, is that by it being our own device, we can control the safety of the domain that we're giving to students. Okay. When it's on their personal device, I have no idea what your personal security settings are. So, you know, I, I can control your settings and from a data privacy point of view, when I'm providing you the device and say, yes, your device I'm handing you is within all data privacy and secure boundaries that we're expected to fulfill. Whereas on a personal, I, I can't ensure that. You know, um, but yes, we do have software. And just so you know, that software cost is based on our whole student enrollment. So basically all we would do is we would take um, that that's already accounted for within our budget because you pay for that license as a district anyway. It's not by device. It's by student population. Just so you know. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm all set. Neil? Okay. Let's see if I'm muted. Are there any other Camille. questions with regard to technology? Yes, Camille. Okay, Rich. As you described the IT manager role um, in providing professional learning at the building level, and I know from the tour that we did of the schools um, this last year, that, that your techs also kind of provide that support to the, the teachers, at least at the elementary level they did. How does that impact the professional development budget? Because some of the meetings that I was listening to, it sounded as though some of that professional development was to enable the teachers to become more technology um, equipped and adept. Would there be any impact on the reduction of professional development budgets by having that information management? So I, so I think one of the things we're aware of is that because of uh, the reduction already in our professional uh, development line item is that we will be relying heavily on colleague to colleague professional learning, um, especially over the course of the next year. Um, and I think that's one of the things to the instructional tech as well as for the manager over time. Could that manager help in regards to saving money because of their skill set in regards to technology and the investment I make in them and their ability to impact the masses? Yes, possibly, absolutely. I mean, in an ideal world, you know, we always want to have the skill set in house. So then, an ideal model for me for professional learning is a level of coaching. 
you know, and, and Rich, that's a little bit of what you saw um, in one of the classrooms you were in where, you know, that instructional tech with that general ed teacher right in the learning moment is a sweet spot for professional learning. You know, you're seeing a teacher implement, they're getting coached and supported on the side for that instructional tech. And I see that manager as, they right now I'm overseeing those five people um, and really helping to try and support and creating the professional learning model and the coaching model for technology and what that looks like. Um, and then I'm also going to be held accountable, obviously, to implement this blended learning framework and support the curriculum revision cycle and things of that nature. So, yes, the hope is that the manager is having a team based approach to professional learning has advanced skill set of our staff, but also by me investing in their skill set, yes, we could do a lot more in-house sort of development of our staff. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then there, there's another question that I had that maybe I'm just a, a little bit confused. It was when we were talking about the end of the year funds from um, 1920, mm -hmm. and it was 435,000. Uh, it sounded like that was going into the infrastructure. And I, I, I'm a little curious how that relates to the budgeted amount for infrastructure spend for 2021. It, are these separate items or are they similar or, or connected in somehow? Rich, just to be clear, let me just uh, make sure you, know, you said 435,000. Um, that, that's not all, not all end of the year funds. Um, I think you're mixing the CIP remaining dollars that we had, the 200, with okay. um, the other end of the year uh, amount. So that's a, that's a separate amount. The only thing we're looking for is the 206 out of end of the year funds um, for technology as of, as of right now. Um, and obviously the CIP dollars for this, for this year. So that makes up that okay. um, just over 400,000 total for this, for 1920. Okay, because it, it just sounded as though some of the infrastructure upgrade was going to occur during this time while the buildings are empty before we get to next year. Yeah, and that's the CIP dollars that we're looking at. Now that's, that's the usage of that because that's money we have that you know, we, we were planning to spend um, and for this, for this current year, that's what was approved last, you know, last summer for this year. So that, that's the infrastructure dollar. We, we, we're not moving forward yet on any further infrastructure, like the middle school, for instance. In middle school is well over $200,000 investment in the infrastructure. Um, we, we have to make sure that you know, we're going to be able to have end of the year money as well as acquisition plan money you know, to move forward with that. Okay, and, and then the, the last question, um, this is probably a softball one. For the, um, for, for the building infrastructure, is it primarily increasing the capacity of the, the Wi-Fi or is it more servers or um, what, what's involved with the infrastructure improvement? Yeah, so it's really mostly access points. So if you think about it from a place of it's running wires so that there's more access points in classrooms so that classrooms can support more devices wirelessly. It's about us really saying to students and staff, you're gonna have access anywhere you go in our buildings. Right now, you're gonna, you, well, you would notice in Akiva when you walk in, you're gonna see almost like a U-shaped shut, setup of desktop computers, right? Those are all plugged in, hardwired in. Um, and then you're gonna notice there might be one, there could be two laptop carts um, within a Kiva structure. And those, you know, um, 40 laptops that might be in that Kiva, everybody knows only one teacher with 20 students can connect at a time mm -hmm. because all 40 mm -hmm. right now in that Kiva is not successful. So the bulk of this is about running wires to make sure. And then the other piece of it, I mean, you know, think about you as a parent, if you're in the middle school or high school building, you know, as you're working, walking down the hallway with your phone and all of a sudden you're like, I lost signal, you know? So I think the other piece of it is that you're not only providing access points that have greater capacity in every single one of your classrooms, but you also obviously have to run um, stronger, stronger wires to your servers to make sure that there's no interruption. And the middle school when it was built was built with 13 server closets. <laughs> so um, that's a fun infrastructure project, let me tell you. So um, that's what that involves. So it's really the access points and the wiring um, that you're really going after. And then what you need with additional access points is you need additional switches 
in right. your um, closet in order for additional access points to have a home, basically, if you think about it that way. So that's in the simplest form, the way that I can describe it. You did very well. Thank you very much. Yes, that's hey. all, uh, Camille. <laughs> I have one. I have okay, imagine, question. I imagine as we digest some of that, uh, the technology plan, um, if we have additional questions, we can certainly reach out through email to, to Amy um, between now and deliberations, but perhaps it's a good time to move on to other areas of the budget that um, somebody may have questions on. So, uh, yeah, pardon? Question. John, I Birmingham? Peter? That's okay. I, that's okay. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll move on. We'll move on. Yep. Yep. We'll move well, on. I was going to call. Uh, oh, I okay. So raise your hand. Who has you more questions? Me? Who, John? Yes. So John and Peter yes. have more questions. Okay. <laughs> Let's start with John. He's our other veteran on okay, the board. Okay, I'll be quick. Board. Okay, yeah. John. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, getting back to the 350 devices, uh, was that the total amount of devices you sent home, or was that the, the number of students that needed them? That's you, the amount of devices that, yeah, I can hear you. Um, that was the amount of devices okay. that, that we sent home. 300 of them went to 300 yeah. students. So our criteria at the start was to just make sure every household had a device. And so one student and in that, grade, you know, go ahead. What grades did that cover? What grades? What grades did that cover? Pre-K to 12. Across the did, board. How did you determine which students we surveyed the parents and had them complete a technology survey. And then we kept, we contacted every single family by phone and set up a deployment methodology over the course of two weeks. Okay. The other question was, I mean, the uh, iPads for K through one, for those young kids, do, do those devices go home? I, they, they could. Yes, they, they could. That's see the, the nice blue case is there for a reason. It's think of it as like a bumper <laughs> uh, for, for those kiddos. But yes, I mean, we really want to adapt our kids from that school to home responsibility. Obviously, there's a transition in that, you know, kindergartners are transitioning to school. So we have to, we have to decide when that's, when that's appropriate. But yes, ideally, we would like them to go back and forth. Now, for, for grades two through 12, for the laptops, all of those go home to all those grades? Correct. Okay. Now, how do you determine, how do you enforce those coming back from the home? So we have what's called a responsible use document that we have as a board policy that we have students and parents sign at the start of every year. And then what would happen is that that's where the insurance comes in. So in addition to them understanding that they're entering into agreement with a device, that's where the accountability of the insurance comes in. And that's where you're, you're reaching an agreement with a parent that there is a commitment of this back and forth. John, at the high school level, you know, it's nice. Yeah, and at the high school level, John, it's, it's real easy because it's, at the high school level, it's real easy because, you know, transcripts and so forth don't get released, um, you know, and those need to be released for kids, uh, you know, upon you know, graduation and leaving. So um, it's like, you know, textbooks, you know, too. They don't, uh, they don't return the textbooks. You know, we charge them, we hold on to report cards until we get them back. So for the whole school, that's 2,700 devices that go out Potentially, Correct. yes. Did you hear me? Potentially, yes. 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 Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's it. That's all I have. Okay, Peter, Thanks, did you have a, a, any questions relating to technology? I'm going to hold my question on technology and, and let the meeting move forward. We'll, we'll circle back to it when, later at another meeting. Okay, sure. Fine. Uh, fine. So then I just have a quick question on the funding of the technology plan. 
So again, just so we're all on board, the entire plan, the cost of it is $1.3 million, give or take, which will be funded up front and paid back at the rate of $275,000 a year for five years, correct? Correct. Part of that $275,000 that hits the operating budget is going to include the upgrade of the Wi-Fi to the high school and the middle school, as well as the acquisition of more devices. So at the end of five years, when we need to start replacing some of that inventory, because we've purchased now these devices, we're going to slowly need to start replacing it. We could probably expect that $275,000 to come down a little bit because we've already made the investment in the, in the Wi-Fi and the internet access, and we're just replacing devices at that point. Yes. Would, would that be a fair assumption? I'll answer that. Yes. How about Mariana? <laughs> Um, yes, in the sense that you are, the infrastructure is a cost that will last you, you know, upwards of seven to 10 years. And so, yes, you are looking at a longer term investment in regards to that. Yes. Okay. All right. So why don't, why don't we move on to other questions other than technology? Uh, raise your hand if you have some other areas in the budget. If, Okay, so Peter, why don't you go ahead? Okay, I got a couple questions early on uh, when you talked about the reduction of your 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 reduction in the initial budget, and you reduced it by eight hundred and twenty-six thousand. One of the one of the cuts was made in not hiring staff, which it seemed that it's going to result in larger class sizes. Um, what are the larger class sizes numbers? I remember I was at one of the board of ed meetings when this was discussed in pretty painful detail. And I'm just curious what, what, what final numbers you're looking at. You were cutting out some of the early K-1 first yeah. grade teachers. And I'm just wondering what that results in the class size. Let, let me show you a slide, uh, Peter, which will, will help give you a, a picture. Because the, the impacts you know, is going to be at the, at the elementary um, level. So um, let me go back to uh, the slides here. Um, and. Uh, Actually, you know what? Hold on, let's see. That's a, that's a nice slide, but I don't think. <laughs> wait, wait, you know, I, I got I to get into a different uh, uh, a different slide deck. Just one sec. Um, now, uh, there we go. Let's see right here. Um, you know, one sec. I'll pull it up. While you're searching for that, Jeff, I'll just say if anybody needs to take a break, you know, feel free to just shut down for a minute and um, and then come back because I don't think we'll take a break in this meeting. We'll just keep rolling. But don't be uh, afraid to leave if you need to for a few minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, there we go. Okay. Let's try this one more time. If you take a look at um, th this is um, the current 1920 enrollment count at the elementary level. Um, and so this, this is this year. So okay. what you have to do is just roll everything forward a year. So kindergarten to first grade, yep. first grade to second grade, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Um, so the issue we had this year, Peter, you can see the 21 students at Lily B. Haynes yep. and yep. the 20 students you know, in kindergarten Flanders. Those numbers now, with the reduction of the kindergarten and first grade teachers um, out of next year's budget, are going to now roll forward. So they're outside okay. the realm of what the Board of Ed guidelines are. So first grade will now have you know, 21 students in Lily Haynes next year uh, and 20 students in first grade at Flanders next year. That's the average. Okay. Some of you know, it's 21, 22, you know, they, they average over the three, four classrooms. Um, so, okay. yeah, so that gives you a picture of what the numbers you know, will look like next yep. year, just okay. everything from there. High, okay. teens, high teens, low 20s. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And um, one other question while I have the floor. Um, you also said a, a reduction in substitute services. I assume that means uh, the budget for substitute teachers. And what's the impact of that? Like, 
first grade class goes without a teacher if they call, you know, I mean, just wondering what the impact of that means. And Mariana, can you um, address that, uh, the exact amount again for substitute services and go back to the slide, but I don't think there's going to be, there shouldn't be an, we just kind of reduced. Well, we, yeah, we reduced it. We're going to um, hopefully be able to offset some of it with depending on again, what happens with next year if we're out again for a, a period of time. Okay. You don't, you don't need need to substitute teachers. And then, okay. Yeah, and then we thought okay. um, if there is a need or we don't, we aren't shut down, we could hopefully offset some of that with revenue funds. Okay, okay. So the, so the reduction would be because you're not using substitute teachers now. Okay, Correct. got it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, and... Um, Actually, for the record, um, Camille, you asked the question that I was going to be asking uh, on, on the technology. So, <laughs> okay. So my question was asked. Okay. Thank you. Um, Camille, you're on mute. Thank you. I'm looking at the revenue projection sheet that you had sent us and noticed that the Salem and other district tu tuition had gone up $300,000. So is that, uh, do you feel confident in that projection? Is that based on the number of high school students that you feel are going to be coming to the district in September? Or is that an increase in tuition per child? There's a, there's a little bit of a, an increase in tuition based on the tuition calculation, but there is an increase in, um, in the enrollment as of the date that I did this. I did um, put a little bit of a buffer because some of the students don't come here like our students. Some might go to a magnet school or a tech school. So um, again, I think I used a number of about nine that might not be attending. Um, East Lyme High School. So if more students go to a GOAG school, then obviously that would impact that number. Or if less students come in, then that number would be higher. Um, and, and again, I don't know from the time I do this till September if people move out of, you know, students move out of Salem, that obviously impacts the numbers. So I, that's, you know, my best guess right now based on the enrollment. And then again, I, I did reduce that enrollment number by a few students to take into consideration other options they have for high school. So if you've reduced the number, what was it before? I mean, right now we're showing, uh, I'm not sure we're talking about the same which thing. So which are you and talking about, Camille? I'm okay. talking about the revenue projection. So the, yeah. the revenue that we get from Salem yeah. increased last, from last year to this year, $300,000, which means more students will be attending Correct. high school from Correct. Salem, right? And, yeah. and you're saying that's about nine students? No, no, I'm Even sorry. Nine. So when I, I looked at the eighth grade enrollment, so the eighth grade enrollment for Salem is higher than it was last year. Okay, so it's going up. But what I'm saying is if it was 60 students that are enrolled in, um, and I can get you the exact number if you need, but if there are 60 students enrolled in Salem, I only counted 51 as coming to East Line. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so I, you, I, I understand now. Yeah. So, so, my, so this, so after hearing that explanation, my question is I see in your staffing plan that you did take away one of the high school teachers that you had planned on hiring. So if that's 51 students, a so that was a social worker. From, that was, that was a, a social cert, worker? Certified okay. position, it was a social worker we had put in and then we, we did not. So the 50, just say give or take students that will be coming into the high school next year from Salem. Um, we'll be able to spread that out throughout the high school so that we can still maintain a good class size, right? Without having to hire. Okay, that, that was my question. All right, thank you. Um, we, we did a lot of talking tonight about what savings would be left over from this fiscal year. And I think that, that you've touched on some of those areas. Um, 
What I think is important to talk about also are the areas that we went significantly over the budget. So for example, I think I had heard at one time that the amount of money we were spending for the special education students was significantly higher than what we budgeted for. So I think when we talk in terms of what we will be saving, I, we need to also pay attention to what the shortfalls would be. And so I don't know if somebody wants to um, speak to that shortfall number. Yeah, let me let me talk a little bit, and then Kim, um, I'll have you you know kind of chime in. Um, yeah, that that the the bulk of that number um, fell around you know students that um, you know we that had moved into district that we weren't anticipating um, that had high costs um, to them uh, through whether it be outplacements or, or you know specific needs you know in district. That special education number every year is you know you do a snapshot of it and you don't know what it's going to look like you know for the next year you know it can go the other way too you know, to help you where students could move out of district um, you know like I think you saw you know, in the old Lyme article so a few students moved out of their district and saved them a couple hundred thousand dollars I think in special education. Um, we went the other way this year where uh, it went up in costs uh, Kim, I don't know if you, know, you want to highlight anything specific on that. Yeah, sure. The other thing that we are calculating in that tuition now, Camille, is any students who are expelled um, because the state law changed around that. And so when a student is expelled, we are responsible for providing them 900 hours of instruction, which is roughly what typical students get. And so that's in an off-site location. Um, and so you can either create your own program or you pay tuition, you know, to another program. And this year we've had uh, three students uh, for tuition in, you know, in uh, under that sort of unfunded mandate, if you will. So that accounts for an increase in the tuition. We just include that with that tuition as well. Yeah, okay. you used to only have to pay and, 10 uh, hours of food a week. And I don't, of course, I'm not going to have it handy. Um, so I'm looking at the uh, the object summary budget to actual report that I had requested. It's a year to date um, expense. And if I look at line item 560 tuition, that's, that's what we're talking about, correct? So I see a deficit or not a deficit. I, I see that we've overspent in that account by 629,000. Is, is that what that line item is? The special tuition for those students and the expelled students? So we're $629,000 short in last year's budget to cover unfunded mandates of special education. Is that, is that correct? So expelled students do not necessarily qualify for special education. Um, you know, they're, those two things are you know, independent of one another. But if we pay tuition to another agency to provide for the expelled student, then they're counted in that object code. Um, and then, as Jeff mentioned, we so that combined with a few new students who needed out of district placement or moved into the district with that out of district costs around them, it, you know, combined leads to the um, that number. Okay. And Marianne, I don't, you know, if you is that no, no, that's to add further detail. Nope, that, that's correct, Camille. That's the tuition line. It encompasses um, all tuition and the bulk of why the tuition amount is over is because of, you know, unanticipated placements and costs. Right, right. right. Okay. Very good. So, um, I, I, uh, to follow up uh, on Camille's question, that was part of my calculus also in, in looking at you know, exp uh, things that you may have saved, things that you may have, you know, spent more money on. And definitely, you know, special ed seems to have been one of them because of, I understand there was a temporary freeze. So it would be really helpful because sometimes I can't, I can't get my head around the, the calculation um, for the uh, excess cost grant application and how and you know where it applies and then all of a sudden it doesn't and then you're in the hole so many thousands of dollars so maybe a little explanation of that excess cost grant might be helpful um and then also if you had 
and if you can indicate that number, uh, um, you know, of, what, of what, what sort of hole we were in and how that's being patched up, because that's, that's pretty vital to understanding your overall financial health, you know, as we go forward, it's really important. And uh, as it would have been, let's say, with our health insurance, if there's issues there, th those, those little holes or extra costs, you know, can, can negate certain things and certain advantages that we've had, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks saving money, we need to take a look at those things. Yeah, Commander. So do you, I, I can explain or, or Kim, but the excess cost grant, um, so I did include, because I know last year, Ian, you had um, questioned it as well. So um, yeah. in the budget book, I don't know if you had a chance, there's um, some information there that um, I think explains I some of the excess cost information. But um, so um, one thing, one of the items is that per pupil expenditure that I think Camille asked about. So depending on who's placing the student, um, typically it's, I don't know that we have any state place student. We, um, they will only reimburse us, I believe it's four and a half, and Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, four and a half times that per pupil cost. So once we hit that per pupil cost, then we begin to be reimbursed. But we are not reimbursed at 100% of that. Um, I think if you see in the, um, on page 11, like this year or last year's calculation, we were, we were due $501,000, but we only got $374,000. And they only reimburse us up to our filing on March 1st. So if we have any added students after March 1st, we can't get reimbursed for that as part of the excess cost in this year. It would go on to next year's um, okay. excess cost. But so if we have two students or three students come March 1st or even one student, because it can be, I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but for three months or four months, it does add up we can't get reimbursed for that. So, so if you have one or two students that come after March 1st, that impacts our grant as well. So um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. No, that's very helpful so to again, know because that's, that's definitely at least a cash flow problem at a minimum. And it could right. be, and you could also just be in the hole uh, right. if they're not giving a full reimbursement for the four and a half times. So what triggers right. that? What, what does that, what, let's say, uh, so they're our, not giving you like an insurance reimbursement that's you know not equivalent to the to the your, the cost of your examination or something. So, so we, why is that? Do you is it a formula used? It's that, just a formula used by the state. It's been that way um, since I've been doing this for for twenty years. Um, I think the amount that um, that they reimbursed that they used to reimburse districts was perhaps higher. So I just took a quick 18, roughly our per pupil is 17 or 18,000. So when I multiply that times four and a half, that's $81,000 per student that we would be responsible first before anything kicks in. And right. then um, the excess cost would kick in. But again, we don't get um, the full amount of what we would be due. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you're kind of um, at a disadvantage, if you will, for lack of a better word, you know, along the way, whether, you know, uh, like three times in a way. <laughs> so, right, um, right, right. And then right. coupled with the fact that anything after March 1st, we don't get reimbursed for at all. Um, okay. So, perfect. so this year, um, I don't know what that number was, but um, have you been able to plug that hole or not? Or we still have some something looming out there? that $629,000 hole? Yes. Um, I'm anticipating based on our um, filing in March, we're probably only going to get another $75,000 of excess cost money, roughly. So certainly that'll go to offset that a little bit, but um, it's not going to, we're not getting $600,000. While it would be nice, we're not getting that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, hence we had started that budget freeze back in March that you mentioned, Ann. Okay. Yeah. And okay. So would you just continue that forward if I could ask? I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if you're unable to pay that at this time, or let's say, you know, school begins, school begins in August, September, who knows what the world's going to look like <laughs> in a couple of months. But um, would you continue that? Um, have you had that kind of a uh, of a hole before and how have you dealt with it? I'm just trying to get a handle on that. 
Well, that's where it goes, you know, back and forth with some years are good, some years are bad. But yeah, the, you, we had to freeze, you know, the budget to try and, you know, utilize you know, from other areas to cover that cost. The other important factor is, you know, you think, oh, maybe, you know, with, with us, you know, kids being out of school right now, um, those uh, facilities, um, those outplaced facilities, and we have 13 students, you know, within them, um, you know, they're still charging. They're, they're still providing educations remotely, you know, to the students. So we're still paying that amount of money. Those didn't just shut down and we don't have to pay them anymore. So we're still paying in full. Mm -hmm. So I understand that what you could reduce is from that, from the legal memo that I, uh, I did read, uh, that you could reduce hours, not, not the plan, the plans is in place and not touched, but you could reduce hours if those hours of service don't actually happen. So for example, uh, let's just say it's speech therapy and, and five hours is given instead of eight hours. There you would be okay according to the governor's order and the legal interpretation by Department of Education, but otherwise you need to pay it. Well, That's according to the governor, yeah, and according to the governor and the legal order, but tell a parent that that is expecting, you know, that amount of service time for their child. Um, right. Here's where, you know, there's outside advocates that are ramping up and saying, hmm, you know what, lawsuits might be, you know, pending because students aren't getting what they're supposed to be getting by law under the guise of a, an individualized education plan. Okay. So, well, that's, yeah. where, that's one of the things we're worried about for next year and compensatory mm -hmm. services um, that we might have to pay for. We could have a handful of parents that could come forward. Uh, you know, and expect, you know, additional services um, that they didn't get over this course of this, this shutdown uh, and the district to pay for those services mm -hmm. from an outside. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's good that we're having this conversation because it is an area that is, you know, right with a lot, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a difficulty. So um, good that, you know, you're addressing it. And then insurance costs, that's a, that was another one looming. I mean, health insurance, we're on the better plan, the 2.0 plan, more predictability. Um, uh, Townside has done pretty decently, but I don't know how, you know, you have all done with Board of Ed and if that's another source of, of difficulty or it's been smoother sailing this, this part of the year. Yeah, much smoother sailing. You know, claims uh, claims are down. Uh, it's leveled out, okay. which which is very helpful, and you know, for budgeting purposes, moving into next year. Okay, okay. So that should not be a major source of worry. Uh, you know, okay, that that's good. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. <laughs> so Camille, you're you're muted, Camille. <laughs> I am so sorry. My son's playing the drum, so I keep muting myself so you guys don't hear that. But um, if I recall, I think about three years ago, wasn't the increase in the health care premiums over 18%? 18 to 21% for a couple of those years where we were in the self-insurance business? Yes. And so this year, your budget includes an increase of 4.5%. So Point. doing significantly better, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't know the state. The state plan, you know, come October one, is going to increase some. You know, we don't know, you know, exactly what that raises, but they held off, uh, you know, until October. Um, usually, it would be sooner. So, and Mariana, you haven't seen any indication of what the number is going to be yet, right? I know I haven't. Um, Chuck, Chuck sent something late last night, um, but I don't see a, a, a big change. Um, and again, it's not set. Nothing's final right now. Okay. But that won't be final until October. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I know I've asked this question of you all before, but I, I feel like I need to ask this for the record. So anybody that's tuning in, they might have this question as well. Um, are there any federal or FEMA monies that we could apply for in a grant that might be able to cover part of this technology acquisition plan. Um, so I think with the COVID, right. yeah. right, go ahead, Jeff. Mariana, specific to technology, I, I don't, we looked into that, didn't we? I thought that, uh, well, you're muted, Mariana. Okay, 
so so the the FEMA funds, as far as I can see um, right now, the only allowable is um, category B, which is preventive uh, safety measures. So it would be first responders. It would be probably anything we would any excess cleaning and things like that. Preventive measures. There are t um, there is another grant. Um, I had sent Anna. I, I think the state is looking for information from all districts and towns. There is um, some CARES Act money, which at the governor's discretion will be used to offset educational costs. So how that will be distributed has not been determined. I um, sat on a webinar yesterday where July 1st, this, by July 1st, the state has to file for the funds and then how they distribute that to the local LEAs, I, I don't know. I did inquire and um, there is nothing right now that has been established as to how that gets applied. And um, I, I believe Anna's on this call. I, I do know someone from the state reached out to her to get some uh, you know, expense information from both the town and the Board of Ed, which I sent to her. So um, I, I, you know, I don't know if-, if Do you have Ed anything to add to that, Anna Johnson? Ooh. Yes, hello. So um, what we submitted to the state totaled about $380,000. It's for um, uh, what we've expended to date and what we anticipate expending through the end of the year. And it was for both the town and the Board of Education. Um, and it included um, over time any um, cleaning supplies that we purchased, um, PPE, um, I think unemployment, um, uh, technology purchases, um, those are just the things that I can remember, but both the combined total for the town and the board was about $380,000. Yeah. So I, and, so and I don't if I, and if I, I was just going to say, Anna Johnson, if I remember correctly, I think I had asked at a prior um, board of finance meeting that even if we were to apply for those grants, that there would not be uh, a stream of income coming in in the next fiscal year. It would more likely be pushed out to maybe 2022. By the time they, by the time they settle all these claims and. Yeah, I mean, you have to remember, typically when we apply for FEMA funds, it's um, localized in a certain part of the country. This is countrywide. So you can you imagine how, how much time it's going to take for them to get through everything. And there isn't a certain percentage, Anna, that, you know, is your mark that you would get back of, you know, say a number of 380 or that's just undetermined. So it's seven, it typically 75% reimbursement. So okay. say 260, 270,000. Okay. But, um, you know, uh, Camille, there is that, that source of the $1.4 billion that is coming by way of the CARES Act to the state of Connecticut. But as you mentioned, it is, it's, in, it's within the purview of the governor to determine how that's dispersed. And my understanding was that, for example, local boards of education were trying to, um, you know, make, a, make a, a claim on that and stake a claim uh, depending on their needs, as, as well as uh, towns overall, uh, because a lot of the money seems to be, have been sort of directed to large municipalities. So the question is the smaller municipalities, can they also benefit in terms of population? So, um, but that's yet to be seen, but it'd be interesting to see what the, what the time frame is for that. Once it is decided, will it be dispersed? quickly. Uh, FEMA seems to be on its own timetable, a year, two years, whatever, but, but this, this larger amount, um, it'll be very interesting to see what, what happens. And I know at the, at, from what I've read at the federal level, the uh, Federal Department of Education is really trying to push for um, additional funding. So I don't think it's a closed chapter, but it's very fuzzy. And I don't think, um, we can rely on it. I mean, FEMA is a little different, you know, because it's an existing structure and, you know, but this other money, it's, it's going to be very interesting, you know, Hartford, because of its population could get more than a small town in Connecticut. So Anne, who would you say would be advocating on our Board of Education's behalf? Would it be the local Board of Education or, or would it be our state senator or state representative? 
who would really be the advocate for getting a, a chunk of that change? I'd say, you know, Board of Ed has a voice, uh, definitely. And I definitely think your representatives have a voice. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, townspeople too, you know, I think that's really important um, to uh, write to your representatives and, and, and push for that because the money is there. I mean, the federal government has put in place so much money, you know, one way or another. Um, so uh, it's, there's definitely money there. And that's, that's the Connecticut portion, that 1.4 billion. But that has to go to a number of things. A lot of it is directly, you know, COVID related, you know, whether it's uh, hospital directed PPE, this kind of thing. But there's still, there's that. And then there's, a, there may be another little pot for, for education, you know, that's either an add on to the original bill or part of that? Or perhaps because, you know, I, I can see our two and a half uh, billion dollar uh, slush fund in Hartford being liquidated pretty darn quickly. But it's so, worth an inquiry, you know, by a Board of Ed, sure, uh, as well as, you know, uh, asking your local reps to help you out and, and, and write a letter, put some pressure to bear. And it is something we talk about regionally, you know, across, you know, the superintendents and part of our, um, you know, our superintendents uh, organization through CAPS um, at the state level. So definitely being discussed. Yeah. So I, I, if this is Mark. I just want, I don't, don't want to confuse the two things. So okay. FEMA reimbursement is a whole separate pile of money and the town is well organized in receiving funds from FEMA, that those would be expended funds, not budgeted for expenditures, that we would be responsible, well, we would be eligible to get 75% back. The CARES Act money that are, that are going to all, that, that's going to all the states, really, in my, my understanding, that's going to go and help the state um, make up for all the lost revenue. So we can be hopeful that the Connecticut gets somewhere back to zero so that our ECS monies and our town aid money uh, doesn't get uh, defunded. So we could, I, I'm not sure that they're going to be at the cash register handing out extra money to schools as much as we're, we should be hopeful that the money they're getting from CARES and the federal government is going to be coming just to reimburse the states for the lost revenue, which is significant. We have, you know, um, people out of work, so there's income tax and then there's sales tax. They're talking about two to two and a half billion dollars in lost revenue with the state. And they're hopeful to get 1.5 to 2 billion back uh, from the federal government, which would really lessen the burden to the state of dipping into the, either the rainy day fund or having to cut back to all the cities and towns on the um, ECS money which is our biggest, that that's our biggest aid from the state, as we all know. So, so the message, Mark, is just, let's just be hopeful that we still get what we're used to getting, never mind getting it additional. I think that's yeah, what I don't you're think saying. That, I don't think there's going to be a, 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 a feeding at the trough um, on this one. I, I, we should be hopeful that we get what we get. And, and uh, so far, that's, that's been the promise out of Hartford as they suspended the, leg, uh, the legislative session. Um, I think the money going to the states is just to reimburse them to try to make them whole so that they can make us whole um, and, and get us back to the numbers we're expecting. The FEMA money, if the schools, and, and I know the schools are doing a good job too, they have extra expenses with the FEMA and that they'll be eligible for, for reimbursement. Mm -hmm. uh, the town certainly is. Uh, this is a different kind of emergency. This isn't trees being down and telephone wires um, across the roads and such, but it's still um, lots of losses um, that were unbudgeted for that we will go back and get reimbursement for. Okay, thank you, Mark. Just a, a last point on that. I, yeah, th there's definitely several funds, you know, operative. The FEMA, as Mark mentioned and Anna mentioned, is definitely a separate process and fund, but th there's the original CARES Act and there's all the subsequent amendments. And it's really, uh, I still say there's some political pressure to bear because um, the funding is, is being, you know, the, the, the legislation is being passed to, to have this funding come through in, in different waves. 
so I, I think a, a voice is never harmful, you know, here to, 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 um, to get that. Oops, fumbling. <laughs> I have a question. Who was that, John? Okay, yeah. John. Uh, getting back to your object code summary. I went because school stopped on March 13th and it should have run through June 16th, approximately. That's about a third of the school year. I went through some of the object codes and there should be some savings or money that wasn't spent. And I just honed in on four of them, which are in the 600s, which have to do with supplies, which could run into a hundred thousand dollars, maybe 150. Now a meeting or two ago, I don't know if it was Mariana or who said it, they were going to look into the savings on those object codes. Mariana, did, have you been able to look into that to see how much we can save of unspended funds for the supply codes? Yeah, just to before she, she just to show if you go back on you know, the slide in the slide deck of the presentation, you know we we cut supplies, uh, you know eighteen thousand four hundred and forty dollars, just to just so you're aware. That's it, eighteen thousand. Well, keep in mind, you know that's it's not a huge. It's not a huge, uh, huge account, um, but uh, we did reduce it. I'm looking at four, I'm looking at four, four different codes though. Six, oh, yeah, we'll give, six, yeah, six, give six, us the six, other one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We reduce, go, what no, are go the ahead other and give codes, us the other John. Yeah. What's that? Six eleven. Which is uh, instructional supplies. Supplies. Yep. We reduced that six. John, we reduced that 600. Sorry. 613, which is maintenance supplies. 615, which is ground supplies. And 619, ahead, other supplies. Yes. So we reduced that 600 series um, in total by 43,440. Are you talking about the, the 2021 budget, John? Is that where you're looking at, or are you looking at what Camille had requested yes. for this year's I'm looking budget? At this. Okay, so you're looking at this year's budget. Yeah. So, so that is what I am working on. As Jeff had mentioned, we're working on, um, I've sent emails out to the schools to review all their open purchase orders and to um, you know, close any purchase orders that we're not gonna be using. So we just found out um, Wednesday that, um, yesterday, I, I think, Tuesday or uh, Wednesday, that school wouldn't be coming back. So now we know that we, there is no a possibility to come back. So that's what the schools are working on right now, to go through all their open POs, shut anything down that they have. So I don't have a number right now for you, John, but once I get all the information back, okay. then we are definitely looking at that though. Okay. I, I just want to, John, I just wanted to plug in one thing is, is that, um, you know, Marianne is doing a great job in, in trying to balance, you know, find, find the uh, savings and so forth. And that obviously there are savings that are, that are occurring because we've covered a, a huge deficiency in special ed. Um, and we're also clearly anticipating a couple hundred thousand dollars that we would like to spend against the technology infrastructure. Um, and then it looks like there's going to be probably it could be, you know, close to another couple hundred thousand dollars of, of savings. And that's what she's, you know, that's what she's working yeah. through. And um, at, our, at our meeting uh, next uh, Monday, the board will, will be taking a look, a uh, close look at that and vetting, making sure that we've kind of looked at everything and asked questions and, and um, um, around that so that we can do as fast as we possibly can get to a final number. We'll all have that number to work with. But, uh, and that's, that's what I think Ann uh, Santoro raised this earlier, which is, it's just, it's really important that we have this all um, laid out as you folks, uh, um, you know, uh, really begin your hard deliberations. Okay, thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions for the Board of Ed members this evening?
Camille, I, I have one. Okay, Rich. Uh, I'm wondering for the postage and the, the printing budget, if there's any more room for reductions in that, because as we're moving to the online lear learning, or actually in the online learning at this point, would it take away the need for some of the printed materials and some of the things that are mailed out? Could they go electronically to folks or uh, other forms of, of transportation? Um. I mean, possibly, uh, Rich, we, we can look at that. I, my mind goes to a place of, you know, if we're going to be out for periods of time, you know, next year, that, that's going to lessen. I mean, more and more is moving, you know, to an electronic you know, distribution. Um, you know, so if, take, for instance, kindergarten registration is all done electronically, you know, now, but things that we're sending out and mailing out, there's still hard letters and things that, that need to be sent out. They're happening right now, actually. Uh, but, you know, we, we did reduce, I think we reduced it a little bit, $2,400, I think the number was. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we're continuing to try and look, it's, you know, like it's May, we got a little bit of time left. So looking to see if there's other things that we possibly could reduce, but that one's, uh, and Mariana, correct me if I'm wrong, we're pretty much down to the bottom on that one, aren't we? Yeah. And, and postage is tough because we still have to mail, um, you know, our, our checks for vendors and things of that nature. Oh, so in addition to other mandatory mailings that we have, um, we are not at, uh, paying, you know, why, uh, through wire or anything like that. Right. So we need to mail out. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. I will say we're improving our ability to send IEP documentation um, <laughs> electronically in this situation. <laughs> and that accounts for some of our postage. Our software tool added a new portal where we can share documents. And so I'm training staff like yesterday, today, and tomorrow about that. And so if all that goes well, that may lead to some savings of not sending all the documentation for um, IEPs, but that's, you know, to be determined as we go into next year. And Kim, that's a good thing because that's not just a 50 cent stamp, you know, that those are, right. you know, those are usually pack. like 30 page packets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which are which weigh a little bit more. Right. So I, I just have a, a couple of general comments that I'd just like to get on the record. Um, with the $826,000 re further reduction to your proposed 2021 increase, um, that brings your increase from last year up to 3.3%, a number of which are fixed costs, right? Health insurance, premiums, contractual salary, agreements with the unions, et cetera, et cetera. If we took out the $275,000 for the operational, in the operational budget for, for the technology piece, if we just took that out, then your increase from last year, according to my calculation, would be 2.7%. So, um, I just want I just want that to go on the record because I did have a couple of questions about you know the 3.3% seems still really high given everything that we're facing right now um, with relative to covid and the shutting down and and the economy and I just wanted to make that point take out the technology which we have to do we really have to do that um, it would only be a 2.7% increase So that was one comment that I wanted to make. Again, another comment I want to make is uh, I, I was glad to see on your slides that you had put there that the elementary school project came in $400,000 under budget. And I think it's really important for the folks out there to understand that's, that's not cash in hand. Okay, that's not money that the Board of Education received that they can return to us. That is money that was never borrowed to begin with. So that savings will translate into a savings on the general side of the general government budget in terms of interest payments on bond obligations. So um, it's important to make that point too. I'm glad you included that in your slide. 
Um, I don't know if there's any other high level uh, statements that you want to make with regard to the budget um, in terms of challenges you've had over the years and you know your thought process and just trying to catch up and be competitive with some of the surrounding districts in terms of one-to-one -one ratio with technology. Is there any other closing comments I think I'm suggesting that you would like to make? Uh, I, I, yeah, I'd just like to say a couple of things. And one is on, on the technology. Um, we are we definitely we're going in the in this direction at a at a at a slower rate than what we've been basically are being forced to do. Um, I think it actually is probably a good thing because it because if there's any good out of this out of this pandemic, it's that um, uh, there really is no alternative other than to do what we're doing with the technology and at the rate that we're doing it. So I think that that's that's really uh, really really critical. Jeff's point, a, a couple of other things, just Jeff's point earlier about we just don't know when the kids come back to school and it's not going to be the same. The, 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 the fall is not going to be like last fall. Uh, it's going to be different. And children will have been basically out of the classroom for, you know, six, six months. And we are scared stiff about what the impact is going to be on on the special ed um, budget, and that's why we included in one slide, and we just said we're we're not we're not putting in big buffers of money, saying you know we're we're anticipating this or whatever. But 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 it it just may turn out that that we're going to have to do something um, to balance things out. Um, sometime during the middle of next year um, or to address if there's if there is a big shortfall okay so I, I think that that's that's another that's another point finally I just like to say um, thank you very much for the questions and um, you everybody is I, I, I just sense there's a there's a we're all kind of in this together um, feel and uh, I really appreciate um, all the time that you folks have put in listening to us deliberate and listening to the logic and rationale behind the technology plan it just it's 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 wonderful um that you put in that that extra that extra amount of time uh, so that we're we're able to have good conversations and the questions on all the technology were right right on the money uh, just perfect so so with that i just want to say thank you very much if, if i could just if I could just add on really quick, Jeff, before you close out, it's just as a closing comment. I do, I do want to just, Camille, you brought up about the regional perspective. And I've often said um, in public forum that East Lyme has not been trendy with technology. You know, um, and around us, other towns and communities definitely have. Um, we have certainly put ourselves in a predicament, especially over this pandemic where other districts around us were very easily able to get students and every one of their students a device in their hands. And we were not. We could only make the commitment to parents. We can get you a device in your household. We can't get you one though for every kid. We don't wanna be in that situation again. Um, we feel as though that's happening in the communities around us and that should be happening in East Lyme as far as we're concerned. So that's a commitment and obligation that we feel is right for our kids. And we feel that, that that's part of us doing due justice by them. I guess too, if, if you don't mind, I just like to say, you know, of course, special education is always a wild card. And I know that that's hard to plan for and anticipate and then um, sort of follow up with when those things happen. But, um, you know, the professional organizations and meetings that I've been going to, you know, we've never experienced anything like what's happening right now in, in relation to students with special education needs. And, um, you know, the law lays out really clear parameters that the federal law, a special education idea is a federal law. And so it lays out very clear parameters for what we're responsible to for children. And the federal government has not given us any re relief on those responsibilities to children. So what the state has guided us to do is to do the best we can given the current situation. And so how that will translate via parents and you know, things when we come back on the other side is why Tim is mentioning that as something that, you know, we just might have to be mindful of. And there'll be some really legitimate things that we work through for families that just may 
have an expense around them. Um, and, you know, we may be consulting with, um, you know, our attorneys more often and therefore incur more fees for that. Um, and just sort of navigating our way through that. So I don't, I don't want it to seem like a big negative, you know, piece looming over our head, but just to say that, um, you know, there's just as in any, you know, emergency crisis situation, things on the other side that you can't anticipate. And, you know, we would just want to do our dil due diligence, excuse me, to work through those, you know, fairly and just realize that they may have an expense attached to them. I guess I'll, I'll just close and commend our team, you know, for the effort and time that they've uh, put into all this, as well as the Board of Ed. And again, you know, Tim said it, but another thank you to the Board of Finance members. Really appreciate your participation this year. You're at a lot of meetings, and uh, and that means a lot with, uh, you know, try to work to, to, to build a relationship, you know, together as we move forward. So thank you. You're, you're muted, Camille. I'm muted. <laughs> you still on the drums. <laughs> <laughs> no, he finished. I'll just say thanks to the Board of Ed too, because I really appreciate we, other than this um, multi hour meeting tonight, this could have been a six hour meeting, but it wasn't because we had submitted a bunch of questions to the board one on one. We've had conversations, we listened into your meetings. And um, that, is, that has worked out really well. It's really helped us to get a better understanding of, of the challenges that you're going through. Um, I think it's been a little bit, you know, increased our understanding, not only of the challenges, but in areas where, oh, maybe, you know, we could look, poke, poke our finger in that area a little bit to see if there might be some savings there. And, um, and thank you for all the time that you've taken to respond to our questions, you know, the email the request for information and documents and reports it's it's come timely it's come professionally and it was very easy to digest you know roll that up with the explanations that you've provided it's just been it's been very eye-opening so thank you as well really appreciate it does any uh, okay so so I think if we've wrapped up with our comments, you, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. You can sign off the Board of Ed and the, and the admin. We're just gonna end quickly with some board comments and uh, an adjournment. Um, that's it. We will be in touch if we have more questions between now and begin deliberations. Um, so you might hear from us. If not, um, our, our deliberation meeting begins I think on May 13th. So I don't know if you'll be wanting to uh, dial into that meeting as well and listen to, to how we make sense of all the pieces of the budget, capital, general government, and Board of Ed. Okay, with that. Um, Thank you. I will go around. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Bye to anyone Thank who wants to leave the meeting. Thanks again. Thanks everyone Thanks for all Thank your you. time. Bye bye. So I'll go around one by one and just ask if there's any um, board comments. We'll start with Pete Rosa. You're first on my screen there. Right. Squad. <laughs> first on your screen. Um, I mean, there's a lot to digest. I, I think the overall spirit of the meeting has been really positive, and um, I like. The, the Tim's comment that we're all kind of in this together. And um, I go back to some of the opening comments, you know, six months ago, we didn't know we were going to be in this situation and these are unpre unprecedented times. And um, I think it's important that we continue to work together and, and come up with uh, reasonable solutions. There is no ideal solution and there's no perfect answer for this. Um, I think the Board of Ed has some incredible challenges. I was, uh, and the only one I hadn't thought of that I just heard is that the special ed budget next year could be impacted by the events of this year. And that, that's, that's, um, that, that's, that's a real comment. I mean, that, that um, uh, and, and that concerns me. Um, but I, I, th I think the Board of Ed did a great job in presenting it and uh, making it clear, making it understandable. And I like the I like the um, atmosphere that we're working in. I think that that's real positive, given these difficult times. Um, and I'll have some more detailed questions as we move forward. But uh, thank you. Good, thanks, Peter. How about you, Ann Santoro? 
Yeah, um, well, I'd like to thank the board, uh, you know, for their presentations um, throughout. I mean, starting in January, I guess, basically with uh, presentations by Jeff to the board and, and, and following. Uh, and of course, all the work leading up to the January, um, you know, uh, meetings. Um, and, you know, I think it's been very helpful for us. Um, you know, I, 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 I just hope the, that somewhere the, the public understands the complexity of all this. And, you know, I think, I think they do for the most part, but I just like to underscore it in some way that, you know, the, the problems faced, you know, from the education standpoint, the, the budget standpoint, um, the everyday life standpoint are really enormous here and um, everyone's trying to get through uh, and it's just it, it's it's been a lot of work I mean honestly um, we all started with the budget you know uh, having passed being given to us in March and then with everything happening with um, with the pandemic you know we were required to revisit pretty much line by line what we've already you know come to accept so um you know from that financial and budgetary point of view it's been it's it's a lot of work and uh, our work is yet to be completed because we have to put the puzzle together of you know uh, town departments board of education um payment of debt services capital so um the, 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 you know, the, the bigger uh, work is yet to be done in many ways, but so far it has been tremendous work for everyone in the town. So just want to under, you know, emphasize that in some way um, for, for folks to understand, you know, it's um, no, no one's had it easy. <laughs> so wherever you sit on a board commission, your work for the town, whatever. So thanks. Okay, thanks, Anne. How about you, Rich? Any board comments this evening? Yeah, I, I really appreciate the collegiality and the discussions and the depth of, of the discussions. Uh, I, I think I learned a lot from both the Board of Education and our fellow Board of Finance members tonight and some of the questions that were asked and, and some of the answers. Uh, they're, they're really challenging times and uh, a, a lot of the, the cuts that the Board of Education made, um, even though it, it's a large increase over last year, some are, are to, the, to the very bone. Um, as Peter had brought out about the, the class sizes in kindergarten and, and first grade, the, those are, are, are hurtful cuts. Um, but the Board of Ed took the actions to eliminate the extra positions that they were gonna bring on. Um, with the exception of bringing on the information technology manager, which they, they need because the assistant superintendent needs to be able to focus on curriculum. Um, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge and it's a challenge on the town side too. There are services and functions that are, are necessary in our community. And it, it's a time where we just have to set priorities and realize some things are, going to be sacrifices, but we, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We, we need to work hard and um, I think everybody's doing an excellent job. Okay, thanks Rich. Um, how, about, how about you, John Birmingham? Any closing comments this evening? Uh, yes, I think we learned a lot tonight. Uh, little did we know a year ago, we we're going to head into this budget season in the situation we're in with the COVID virus. But I think uh, we have a lot more to learn. I think it's gonna be, we're gonna to have to make some tough decisions. But I think the group that we have will come to those decisions and uh, hopefully it'll, it'll work out for everybody. Very good, thank you. That's it. And Chikel. Um. <clears throat> I think the meetings with the Board of Ed over the past few months have been really good. I've been enjoying going to them and watching the whole process. I feel like with the onslaught of the COVID-19 you know, that we were basically you know, blindsided. Um, everybody has been. And um, I think that there's a lot of needs that have been presented 
And I think we're going to see them on the education and on the other side. But I think we also have to take into account that, you know, people have lost jobs. And so it's a hard thing to raise taxes. Um, and I just, you know, I literally I'm losing sleep over it thinking, how do you do this? Because you don't want to raise taxes on people, but then there's needs of the community and needs of the kids of the education. Um, so I, I think it is a really, you know, hard place for us to be in, um, especially for me on the Board of Finance for the first time and, you know, going through this. Um, but I feel that the information we were giving tonight, it was very helpful and I'm sure with the town it will be too. And, you know, we'll just have to make some hard decisions. And um, I think that when the kids get back to school, I think that kids are a lot more resilient than you think. I think they're going to, you know, give them a few weeks, they're going to start off and, and they're going to jump right back into it, you know. Um, and I think I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, hopefully the kids getting back to school and things, you know, going back to normal. And um, I'd like to thank the Board of Ed for all the work that they've done um, as I've been sitting through the meetings also. And um, I'm looking forward to um, getting this uh, deliberations going forward soon. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'll have a lot, I, I always have a lot to say, but I'm gonna save it for another time. But what I would like to direct your attention to um, is the website for the Town of East Lyme on the Board of Finance page. And this basically would be, a, there's, there's two attendees left, believe it or not, after all this time. So if you're listening to us, here's the East Lyme Town Hall website. And this is the Board of Finance, um, or this is actually the budget information page. And right here is where the public can submit comments to the Board of Finance. We will not be reading them at our presentation or deliberation meetings, but each one of the Board of Finance members will be checking this website regularly to uh, absorb the feedback that we're getting from the community. And it's very simple. You just click on this link. Oh, here. And we have some comments already. Here's one from Pat Larkin. If anybody is commenting on this um, comment board, we would ask that you uh, not only type in your name in the name field, but also your address for the record. Um, okay, so we already have a few comments already based on this evening's meeting. So over the next week or so, as we continue with our presentations and deliberations, let's each of the Board of Finance members be reviewing this information and um, you know, just to make sure that we get input from the public. That's the way that we'll handle it this year. Uh, I will say when we get to the public hearing, we will open it up for comments um, and limit that to maybe two or three minutes. So, but this is how we're going to deal with the public input just for the presentations and the deliberations again. And um, that's it. That's all I have to say. So our next meeting will be on Saturday, starting at 9 a.m. Um, I just ask that you sign in maybe 10 minutes early so that we can make sure everybody's uh, connected and not having any issues. Um, and we'll be listening to several uh, town departments give their presentations. So I think that covers it. Um, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting this evening from somebody. So moved. Okay, Rich Steele, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Pete, Pete, was that you? Pete DeRosa, second? That was John. That was John. Oh, John, John. Okay, John Birmingham. Okay, thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. <laughs> Okay, everybody. Have a good night. We'll see you on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Bye.